Good afternoon, friends, and welcome back to our big Bible Summit. Good to see you back this afternoon. We're very excited about this opportunity to study not only the Bible, but to study about the Bible. And that is our theme for this series. We're about well, a little past halfway in our study of the Bible in the big Bible Summit. We've got some great presentations lined up this afternoon. I want to remind those of you who are watching online and those here in person, we're going to have a Q&A panel at the end of our presentation this afternoon. And if you have a question about the Bible, about how to study the Bible, or if there are translation questions you have, you can text us your question. If you look at the screen, you've got a QR code. And if you pull out your phone and take a picture of that QR code, That'll take you to the place where you can type your Bible question. It works very easy. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to give your email. You just take a picture of that. It'll send you to the right uh, program, and you can type your Bible question. We're going to try and answer as many of those questions as we can later this afternoon. We also want to remind those who are watching online that we do have a free offer for you. If you'd like to receive the Amazing Facts Bible Symbols Chart, it's free. All you have to do is text the word Bible 777 to the number 40544. That's Bible 777 to the number 40544. You'll be able to download a digital copy of the Bible symbol chart as well as the book written by Pastor Doug called The Ultimate Resource. So take advantage of that. It'll bless you in your study of God's Word. Now we have a theme song for this Big Bible Summit. It's one of my favorite, just a short chorus, but the words are powerful. It's called Ancient Words, and we've been singing that throughout this series. So let's go ahead and stand as we sing together Ancient Words.
Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are indeed so grateful for your word. We are grateful for the sacrifice that's been made by so many so that we can have your word with us today. And Father, we invite your presence in a special way to speak to our hearts and guide us as we study your word even further. And bless our speakers this afternoon and all those listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. To start off this afternoon's presentation, I'm excited to introduce to you our youth pastor here at the Granite Bay Church, Pastor Aaron Cruz. He's going to be sharing with us how to study the Bible, how to make the most of the Word of God. And so we'll turn the time over to him. Hello, everyone. Are you ready to learn how to study the Bible? Amen. Now, I am a pastor, um, and sometimes people ask me, hey, you know, what, what do you like to do for fun? You know, do you like to play basketball? Do you like to do these things? And, you know, I, I have some hobbies I do here or there, but, but really what I tell people is what I like to do the most, and sometimes it feels like it's my job, but it's true. What I like to do the most with my time is to study the Bible. If I was, as a pastor, it's kind of like my responsibility. It's kind of like I get paid to do this. But even if I wasn't, my favorite hobby, my favorite thing to do in this life would be to study and share the Bible. And so I'm so happy I get to share with you about how to study the Bible. Paul writes to his younger friend Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. He says this, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Rightly, some translations say correctly or accurately, handling the word of truth. Now, friends, if there is a right way, a correct way, a accurate way of which to study the Bible, that also means that there is a what? A wrong way to study the Bible. So having a lecture, having a presentation, having the tools that we need in order to study the Bible correctly is something that we are told that we need to do. If we don't study the Bible correctly, of which Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, he says that Paul's letters contain some things which are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. This is an example of distorting scripture, studying the Bible in the wrong way. Now, Notice a consequence of if we study the Bible and distort it in the wrong way. What will it lead to? Destruction. Destruction. So we need to be very careful that we study the Bible according to how the Bible says it needs to be studied. For example, it, let's say one day, you know, you're, you're a parent and you have some children, and they're maybe not obeying the best that day, and they're, they're kind of getting on your nerves, and your, your patience is wearing thin, and you say, God, I need to get a word from you today, and you just kind of open up the Bible to a page, and you point your finger, and you land at this verse. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 29, we cooked my son and ate him. <laughs> and you're like, God, are you telling me something here? <laughs> And then you're like, no, 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 this is, I, I, I must be taking this out of context. So you open the Bible and you turn to another page and it says, go and do likewise. And you're like, whoa, whoa, this, this must not be right. And you open up the Bible to find a quick word and you land at here, it says Jesus saying, what you do, do quickly. <laughs> Friends, this is an example of how not to study the Bible, right? We need to be prepared and approach the Bible and study it according to the Bible's own guidelines. I like to put it this way, we need to study the Bible on its own terms. What are the principles and methods that we should use to study the Bible that come from the Bible itself? And there are four preliminary considerations that we need to think about as we approach the study of Scripture. Number one, we need to recognize the Bible as the Word of God, which has authority, power, and life. We need to approach the Bible as a hungry, humble learner, ready to listen and willing to follow. 
We need to ask and allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and guide, and we need to study the Bible in order to cultivate and sustain a personal, committed, saving relationship with Jesus. These are four non-negotiables when we approach the word of God. Let's look at a few verses that expound upon these. Number one, recognizing the Bible as the word of God, which has authority, power, and life. Although the Bible, as we've been hearing this weekend, was written, yes, by human authors, we read from scripture itself that these human authors were inspired, were moved upon by the Holy Spirit resulting in scripture being an inspired book. 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is inspired by God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So although humans wrote this book, ultimately the author of this book is God himself. And so we need to consider this book as it considers itself in Hebrews 4 4, verse 12, the word of God the word of God, which is living and powerful. Living and powerful. It's not a dead book. It's not a boring book. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse three, we read that the universe, the worlds, were created by what? The word of God. In the beginning, God created and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So this word of God, friends, we need to recognize that this word has power. It's not a dead book, it's a living book. Psalm 119 says, your word has given me life. And Jesus says in John 6, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. We come to the Bible to get life. It's our very source of life. We need it to live. Number two, we need to approach the Bible as a hungry, humble learner, ready to listen and willing to follow. Notice Jeremiah 15 says, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, of course, we're not supposed to pick up the Bible and try to you know, shove it in our mouths, but the analogy between food as a source of life and the words of God being needed to be eaten, right? It's this amazing picture. Proverbs chapter two says, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then and only then when we humble ourselves, when we seek after God with all of our heart, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We have to be willing to let everything go in order to seek out that pearl of great price to say, I wanna search the scriptures for the treasures that God has in store for me. Jesus says in John 7, 17, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. Sometimes people say, well, the Bible's hard to understand. It has complicated things. It's it's too difficult to understand. Only the smart people, the pastors, the theologians, only the wise of this world are able to understand it. Well, not according to Jesus. Jesus says, if you want to know the teachings of Scripture, here is the prerequisite. You must be willing. I will is more important than IQ when it comes to understanding and studying Scripture. Amen? Amen. We don't want to be like those people that Paul talked about in 2 Timothy who said they're always learning, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Because these are people who study the word of God, who study things to obtain knowledge, but, not, but who are not willing to be changed by it. That's not what we should do. We need to ask and allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. In John chapter 16, Jesus says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Every time we open up the Bible, we should ask God to open us up and the Holy Spirit to come in and to be our teacher and our guide. Paul says that these things we speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. We must let the Holy Spirit be our teacher, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 
we have to have the Holy Spirit. I can't emphasize that strongly enough. And our last preliminary consideration is we must study the Bible in order to cultivate and sustain a personal, committed, saving relationship with Jesus. Some scribes and teachers of Jesus' day came to Jesus and they say, hey, we know something about the Bible. And Jesus responded and he says, look, you guys, yeah, you study the Bible. You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, right? They were studying the Bible with saying, hey, we have eternal life. We got the word of God. We study. We get eternal life. But Jesus says, you're kind of missing the point. Yes, eternal life is, is, is involved in this process, but the scriptures are they which do what? Testify of me. The whole point of studying the Bible is to get to know Jesus. Jesus says in John 17, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So as we open up the pages of Scripture, we must have Jesus in mind. Say, Jesus, where are you in Genesis? Jesus, where are you in the Old Testament, the New Testament? Wherever you are, we, are sp- we, we, we hear from Scripture that it testifies, it teaches us about Jesus. Paul says the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. So these are the four preliminary considerations that we must bring with us as we approach the Word of God. Now, the next fundamental point that has to be brought to your attention is that when we go to study the Bible, you don't find time to study the Bible. You make time. Amen? You don't find time like, well, you know, if I just, you know, find some time, maybe I'll just, you know, I'll I'll study the Bible. No. Our priorities are determined by that which we plan for. We need to make time to study the Word of God. Here's a, a, a good uh, comic which says a doctor is, is speaking to his patient. He says, hey, what fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? <laughs> this is what we need to think about when we come to the Bible. What fits your, your schedule better? Being spiritually dead 24 hours a day leading to an eternal death? Or are you going to make time to say, I can't live unless I have the life that the Word of God provides for my soul? Amen. The next thing that we need to, um, when we're approaching our, the study of Scripture, is we need to get a go-to Bible, but study with many. For example, this is my Bible, which I received as a gift from my mother on, in August 2011, as I was going away from college, she wrote a nice note to say, with lots of love, you know, your mom. And this is my go-to Bible. I have it with me all the time. Its pages are, are wrinkly and crinkled up. My wife was just commenting, you got some wrinkled pages. You need to fix that, right? But it's beaten up because it's my go-to Bible. But when I spend time studying scripture, it's important to carry a retinue of translations. Now, I'm not going to repeat everything that Pastor Ross said about Bible translations. You can go back and and listen to his presentation. But when we're picking a go-to Bible as our preliminary Bible, it's important to pick a Bible that's more so on your spectrum of a word-for-word a literal translation. These are the best Bibles to have as your go-to. But when we're studying the Bible, it's important to have multiple translations because ultimately, and we'll come to this a little bit later, no translation is perfect. We're working from the Greek and Hebrew into English or Spanish or whatever your mother tongue may be. So we need to come to Scripture with the tools of a, of a good sword, a good word of God, a Bible translation, but keeping in mind we need to use many. My favorite free, and yes I said it, free Bible resource to get a number of Bible trace translations all in one place is Blue Letter Bible. It's a website that you can go to or it's an app you can download on your phone. Very easy to use, has many different Bible translations, and it's my go-to to help me when I study the Bible. Now, the next thing we need to think about when studying the Bible is when you go to buy a house and you're talking with a realtor about what's the most important thing when considering a house. He'll tell you, well, the first thing to consider is location, and the second thing is location, and the third thing is location. Location, location, location. Well, when we come to the Bible, this applies. Context, context, context. 
Context is probably if you walk away saying, I don't remember a thing he said, but I remember the one thing, context, right? You have to come to the Bible and understand its context. For example, if I said, if I walked up to you and I said, hey, I am green, what do I mean? I could mean a number of things depending on the context. I could mean I am the color green. I could mean I'm new to something. I'm an advocate for the environment. I love gardening. I am an alien from Mars. <laughs> I am wealthy. I am envious. I am sick, right? There's a political party, the Green Party. What do you mean when you say, I am green? We have to look at the context to determine the meaning. For example, when we come to the Word of God, oftentimes people, even though they may be well-meaning, if we come to the Bible with our own presuppositions, with our own ideas, seeking to prove from Scripture what we want to believe, we can very easily distort the meaning of Scripture. For example, when we turn to the book of Acts chapter 10, we read a story about how Peter received a vision, a dream about all kinds of unclean animals, and God told him, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And so sometimes people say, hey, in order to justify their own desires to eat unclean meats, go to Scripture and say, look right here. It says, hey, kill and eat, right? I can eat whatever meat I want, whatever kind of thing I want. But that is taking a context out of context. And a, context, and a text without a context is a pretext, a justification for something you want rather than what Scripture is actually teaching. So when we look at the context of this vision, just a few verses later, we get to verse 28, where Peter tells us exactly what the Lord meant by saying, arise, Peter, kill and eat. He says, God has shown me that I should not call any what? Man, not animal, man, common or unclean right? He's to preach the gospel to all peoples, including Gentiles. So we need to be careful with proof texting. Yes, we're supposed to get our beliefs from the Bible, but if we say, I believe this, and I'm going to the Bible to prove it, right, we'll be in danger of reading into Scripture what's not there and taking things out of context. Exegesis is the proper way in which we are to study the Bible. Exegesis is sort of a fancy word that means to draw out of the text its intended meaning. Eisegesis is to put into the text your own presuppositions, agenda, or bias, and make it say whatever you want it to say. We do not want to do that. We want to practice exegesis, not eisegesis. Now, when we're coming to Scripture and we're trying to figure out the context, there is a huge gap between us and the Bible. If you go to the UK or to London to take the underground train, you'll find this, this posted everywhere. Mind the gap, right? Because as you're on the train platform about to you know, walk onto the, the train, there is a gap there. And it tells you to mind the gap. Be careful because there, if you take too short of a step, your foot would get caught in and it could cause some serious damage. And so there are various gaps between the Bible times when the Bible was written and our modern times. The most obvious gap is a gap in what? Time. The Bible was written some 2,000 plus years ago right? Just think about the generational gap between you and your grandparents or maybe you and your parents, right? A lot can change between the matter of just a few years. And now imagine thousands of years, right? So we need to keep in mind that there is a big gap in time. There's also a big gap in location. I'm here speaking to you in the United States of America in California, right? There is a big gap in location between here and the Middle East, right? A huge gap. Now, I've had the the privilege of going over to Israel, over over to Greece and Turkey, and to look at some of the Bible lands. And when I look at the location, (coughs) excuse me, the Bible at times comes alive, because I can understand when they say, oh, they made an altar out of rocks, and they did this with rocks, and that with rocks. And I'm like, why all the rocks? And then you go to Israel, and you're like, oh, there's rocks here. There's lots of rocks, right? So, understanding the location gap, there's also, there's also a culture gap, a culture gap. In some cultures, 
it, a younger person doesn't make eye, eye contact with an elderly person as a sign of respect. But in some cultures, like the Western culture, if you don't look at someone's eyes and you look away from them, that's a sign of disrespect. So we need to analyze what kind of ancient Middle Eastern context are we looking at. There's also a gap in language. Of course, we have English translations or Spanish translations or whatever, but the original language was Greek, Hebrew, and some parts in Aramaic. And then there's also a literary gap. Different ways in which we write and communicate today are somewhat different than how the ancients wrote in a different culture and time. So there is the ancient biblical times, and there's a bridge there's a bridge that we cross. Every time you open up the Bible, you are crossing a bridge. You are going into another time, another location, another lo uh, culture, another language. And you have to say, how can I understand this on its own terms before we come back to the 21st century and make application? In order to mind the, mind the gap, there are various tools that would be very advantageous for us to keep on hand as we're approaching the study of Scripture. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.13, and he says, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Now, we don't know exactly what the books were that Paul valued so much, but I think it's reasonable to suspect that Paul would have had some Bible study books some Bible study resources, and some of the most important tools that we should take with us as we go to study scripture in order to bridge the gap would number one be an atlas. This is a book full of maps, right? The best thing is to go to the actual location in the Middle East, right? But the next best thing is to look at a map of it. So you can see where's the Sea of Galilee, the Mediterranean Sea, right? The, the Dead Sea, what's the terrain like? These maps help that. A concordance, a good Bible concordance is a, is a resource, a book that shows you where one word that you find in the Bible is used elsewhere in the Bible. This is very helpful when studying a Bible topic or a Bible word so you can see and the concordance helps you connect the dots between scriptures. A cross-reference tool um, is a similar to a concordance, but rather than showing you where one word is used elsewhere in scripture, it shows you where the same idea or theme is used elsewhere in scripture. So this is another valuable tool. And of course, a Bible dictionary is something that you can say, what's an ephod, right? What's an ephod? How does that translate? I don't know about you, but I have difficulty translate, translating feet to yards, to meters, to, to cups, to, to ounces. And so a dictionary can help translate some of those Bible uh, cultural terms to help us get a context, right? So here's just a few books, a Bible atlas, a Strong's Concordance, a Treasure of Scripture Knowledge book, uh, a Bible dictionary that you need to have on hand. By the way, did I mention uh, Blue Letter Bible before? Yes, my favorite tool has many Bible dictionaries and concordances built in within it. You can also consult, there are many study Bibles. The Andrew Study Bible on the left is my go-to study Bible that provides some of these maps and, and con a concordance and various cultural comments that helps illuminate scripture. But we have other study Bibles, an archaeological cultural background study Bible uh, and, a, um, and a chain reference study Bible. These are very helpful. Now, when we're approaching the word of God, we need to keep two things in mind. There is a big picture context and a little picture context. A bird's eye view and a worm's eye view. So if you're here in California, and if I wanted to go visit my parents, they live in Maryland on the east coast of the United States. I would need to take a airplane, right? That would be the quickest way to get there. And if I take an airplane, I'm flying over the entire country and I'm seeing a bird's eye view, right? It's providing me a map of the land. And this is good and helpful to have. But if I want to go and explore, I need to get my boots on the ground and walk through and look at the little details. So when we're approaching scripture, it's important for us to have a big picture view in mind while we're going through the little details. 
and the little details inform the big picture, and the big picture informs the little details. It's always this, this fine back and forth, this dance, if you will, between big picture and little detail of which you're informing yourself about the, 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 the message of Scripture. It's also like a puzzle. If you've ever done a puzzle before, and I know my wife has informed me, some people consider this cheating, but for me, this is just how you do it. <laughs> you have what the puzzle is. <laughs> you have the map in front of you as you piece together the various pieces. And when you have the big picture, it helps you to put together the little details, right? If you didn't have that big picture, it would take you a lot longer. So we need to always have these two points in tension, big picture, little detail. But what I would recommend when we're approaching the word of God is really, to me, I think the most important thing as far as context is concerned is keeping in mind the big picture context. For example, when you go to open up your Bible, as, we have, uh, as it has already been communicated to you a dozen times, the Bible is a collection of 66 books. So when you open up the Bible, you're not just reading one book, right? You could land in Psalm or Malachi or Second Peter, as I have just done, and you need to keep in mind, where are you? Where are you in this book in relation to all the other books? The Bible books have different genres, right? The first five books of the Bible are sometimes referred to as law or instruction, right? Then after them come the different historical books, the Um, the narrative books of the Bible. And these books are mainly historical. Then you enter into the wisdom books, like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And these books are, uh, give you Psalms. These were the, this was the hymnal of the ancient Israelites. Wisdom literature, little pithy sayings that encapsulate timeless truths. Then we have the major and the minor prophets. And these prophets are not necessarily listed chronologically. Keep this in mind. When you go to scripture, not every book that becomes before or after is ordered chronologically. It's ordered more so thematically by genre, by type. And so it's up to you, a diligent student of scripture, is to see where does this prophet fit within the books of Kings or Chronicles or Ezra or Nehemiah, right? So keeping those pictures in mind. Then you come to the New Testament and you have, this should just tell you how important Jesus is, right? We don't have one, we don't have two, we don't have three, we have four books that tell us about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. These are gospel accounts, narrative accounts. Then the then we have the book of Acts, which is a history book, basically, of the early church. Then we have letters, mainly from Paul, but also from Peter, uh, James, uh, Jude, etc. And they're writing to individuals. They're writing to groups of Christians in various places in the ancient world. How we understand a personal correspondence is much different than understanding a psalm or a proverb or a narrative. So we need to keep in mind what genre are we in. A very helpful tool is to use a Bible handbook or a quick reference guide to help get an overview of each Bible book, right? There are books, hundreds of them, that summarize for you just quickly what is the main theme uh, of this book of the Bible. And it's up to us to piece together and understand what is the big picture of Scripture communicating. One of my favorite um, ways to get an overview of any given book of the Bible is a group called the Bible Project. They're on YouTube and they have their own website and they have these short video overviews of different books of the Bible that are very helpful just to get in, you know, five, ten minutes an overview of a whole book before you dive into it. We need to grasp the Bible's unified storyline. Here is a a picture uh, that the Arise Discipleship Program uses to frame their entire training program. And all of their teaching is framed within the major storyline of Scripture. Scripture, you may think, in Genesis chapter 1, says, in the beginning God created the earth, right? And so you think, well, it all starts with creation. Well, interesting, as you study through the Bible, you find that God, of course, existed before creation. And there was a war that broke out in heaven before creation. 
right? And there's a whole narrative of Scripture that actually begins before creation starts. And then you have the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2, of which the rest of the Bible builds on. Then, after creation, we unfortunately have the fall of Adam and Eve, the fall of the human race into sin. But a promise is given that a seed of the woman, a Messiah, would come. And so the Old Testament is a book that is anticipating the arrival, the advent of the Messiah. And enter into the New Testament, we have Jesus, who is God incarnate, God incarnate. God in human form, 100% God, 100% divine, and he is that promised Messiah, amen? And he came to fulfill the promise that he would save the world, that he would crush the head of the serpent of Satan. And once he lived his life and died on the cross and was resurrected again, his followers said, "Woohoo! this is the Messiah. This is who we've longed for and waited for. And they burst out onto the world into the New Testament and they're preaching the gospel. And so we have the church era of the New Testament. And then we reach the, the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which is the second coming of Jesus, where at the end of the book, Jesus recreates the whole earth. This marvelous big picture. The Bible ultimately is a storybook with Jesus as its hero. Amen? Jesus is the focal point. Jesus reveals the love of God. Jesus is our savior, our closest friend, and the one who we should always listen to and follow. Now, continuing on, as you can tell, there's a lot to cover, right? And I'm just scratching the surface. Now, looking at various Bible study methods, one of the first methods to study the Bible is to broadly survey the Old Testament and New Testament. Now, we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, right? Looking at the big picture of the Old Testament, the New Testament, what's the major storyline? But this is a way we can study scripture. Memorize the order of the books of the Bible. Memorize, you know, what is the main point of the book of Hosea? Where does it fit within the Bible chronology? What's the main point of Paul's letter to the Romans, right? You're understanding the big pieces of scripture. But then we can get a little closer. We can start with a book of the Bible. We can say, okay, I'm going to study the book of Genesis. Good place to start. Or the book of John or the book of, you know, Proverbs. And you say, I'm committing to studying through this entire book. And what you do is you take it verse by verse, one verse at a time, unpacking the context with the big picture uh, in mind. We can also do a topical or a doctrinal study. What does the Bible say about what happens when you die? What does the Bible say about the law of God, about the Sabbath, fill in the blank? What you do is, this is where a concordance is very helpful because you can see, you know, where is that word Sabbath or death or salvation used? And you compile all the places in the Bible where a certain word or theme or idea or doctrine is being communicated. And then you look at all of those places in context, keyword in context, and that can begin to build a picture of what various Bible doctrines are teaching. We can also approach the Bible with the method of a biographical study. You want to study the person of David, right? David is a major character in the Bible. Abraham is a major character in the Bible. Of course, Jesus in, in the Gospels is a major Bible character, or Peter. And you can pick a Bible character and study their life. We can also approach and do a word study about grace or faith or any word that you choose. But if you're ever stuck and say, well, I don't know where to start. My wife was reminding me that a good place to start is ask yourself, where am I at right now and what do I need the most? <laughs> when my wife was working a number of years ago uh, over on the East Coast, she found her place in, uh, she found herself in a place of uh, a secular work environment of which she was experiencing some religious persecution. And so she felt a great need to see what God was trying to uh, say to her to help her through this time. And so she did a, a study through the book of Daniel because Daniel was working in a secular work environment, right, in Babylon, and he stayed faithful to God through that time. And so find out what are you struggling with? Are you, are you going through a season of depression, right? Read something in the Bible that speaks to that issue or that topic. The next uh, principle that we need to keep in mind is when, when we're approaching the Bible with these various methods, we need to eat a balanced diet, both physically and spiritually. 
when we eat, we can't just eat all carbs or nothing but protein shakes, right? Or nothing but fats and oils. We need to have vegetables and fruits and breads and grains, and we need to have a well-balanced diet. And so when we're studying scripture, we can't just say, well, I just, I just love the New Testament, and I'm just going to camp out in the New Testament, and oh, I know the Old Testament is, you know, like, you know, two-thirds of the Bible, and it's, you know, the most of scriptures in the Old Testament, but I'm going to stick in the New. No, you need to divide up your study between the Old Testament, the New Testament, and maybe ask yourself the question, maybe there's a reason why you're not studying this particular part. Maybe because that's the part you need to study the most, where God is trying to speak to you through. So diversify your study methods. Diversify your time spent studying prophecy, the Gospels, narratives, Psalms, Proverbs, etc. Now, how to chew on Scripture. There are three basic steps in order to help us chew on Scripture. Now, if you are a, a dietitian, or a nutritionist, we actually find out that when we eat our food, the best number of chews for each bite is 32. Now, most of us just ate lunch. Raise your hand if every bite you chewed 32 times. I don't know, right? I know I don't. My wife gets on me all the time. Aaron, slow down, right? Why do they tell us that chewing our food so much is so important for our health and our diet? Because as we chew it, we're breaking down and we're able to, our bodies are able to process the nutrition that comes with every bite better than if we just scarf it down, right? And so when we read the Bible, we're eating it. Remember, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need to chew on scripture. And these are three ways, three steps that we take in order to help chew on scripture. Number one, it's the observation stage. Number two, interpretation. Number three, application. We're going to unpack these in a moment. But I'm also going to take this, this time to highlight a few helpful Bible study books, right, that further explain in more detail than I'm able to cover in this mere 50 minutes, right? The, here are some simple Bible study books that you can read that help unpack more about how to chew on Scripture, how to approach and study various literary genres. Here are some deeper Bible study books uh, that really dig deep. And then a few more, yeah, take a picture or reference this later, and then a few more here. I would especially recommend the two books that you find on the far left, Understanding Scripture and Biblical Hermeneutics, right? Find yourself a good Bible study book that you can consult to help you navigate through studying scripture to make sure that you're studying scripture correctly. These books go into more detail about what it means to observe, interpret, and apply scripture. Now, getting back to these. What does it mean to observe, interpret, and apply scripture? Well, observation asks the question, what does the text say? Interpretation asks the text, what does it mean? And application asks the text, what does it change? What difference does it make in my life? These are the three steps that we should always be taking every time that we come to the Word of God. Let's start with step one, observation. The first and probably most important thing to keep in mind with the observation stage is that about 80% of our study is spent in the observation stage. We're just sitting and observing what is Scripture saying. We are reading the Scripture, right? You're picking a a, a few verses, a chapter, or a paragraph to study. Just sit there, right, and read it and reread it, right? Read it repetitively, meditatively, meditatively, meaning meditate on it. Think about what is it saying? What do these words mean? Put yourself into the context, right? Pretend through your imagination that you're in the Bible story, right? Ask all kinds of questions. You need to note key words or key phrases that show up in this portion of Scripture. It's important, especially at this point, to read various translations and versions, right, that might explain or translate a key word a little differently, right? Consulting a lexicon to look at the original meaning of the Greek or Hebrew word is also helpful, Always keep in mind context, the historical context, the literary context. Is this book in the Old Testament, the New Testament? Is this an epistle? 
Is this a symbolic prophecy? Is this a psalm? Is this a biblical narrative? Is this a law of instruction? You're keeping in mind all of these contextual clues as you're meditating and just saturating yourself with the text of Scripture. Huge point here is I'm a strong believer that you need to write stuff down. (laughs) Every time you open the Bible, open up a notebook or a journal to help write things down to ask questions. You may find it helpful to paraphrase the passage that you're reading. Put it in your own words, right? This is active listening. When you're listening to someone, sometimes it's helpful to say, what I heard you say was da-da-da-da-da, and they say, nope, that's not at all what I was saying. (laughs) So go back to scripture and say, I think what the author is saying is da-da-da-da-da, paraphrase it, right? Ask questions, be curious, lots of them. Ask lots of questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how? What is the text saying? What is the text not saying? We need to use a journal or a notebook in order to document, to fill in the blanks of these various who, what, when, where, how, why, etc. So here, there are lots of different uh, journals, Bible study, prayer journals that you can use. Uh, Here's one by Frank Hosel, Longing for God. That's a resource you can buy. Or you can just go to any store and buy a blank notebook, right? And just open up a blank notebook or a journal and use that. Or you can buy a Bible that actually has wide margins or every other page is a journal page, right? And you can use your own Bible as its own journal, You notice on the left there, the Bible is single-columned. My mom is especially a big fan of single-column Bibles, right? Because she says, double columns are for newspapers. That's to read it quickly. But when we read single-column, you're taking your time to read through it more slowly. Thanks, mom. (laughs) Interpretation, moving on to the next stage. Interpretation begins with asking the question, "What what would this mean to the original audience? right? Keeping in mind the original context, the original audience. Who's the author and, and who is the original audience he's speaking to? Let scripture interpret scripture. This is probably the most important tool when interpreting scripture. Let scripture interpret scripture. We have in Isaiah 28 verse 10, it says, for precept must be upon precept, line, uh, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. If you want to understand what one passage of scripture means, compare it with other places in the Bible that speaks about similar things. When we're looking at any particular text of scripture, you can think of it like a bullseye. The center of the bullseye is the text. Then you have the next ring, which is the immediate context right? You have a sentence that's located within a paragraph, within a chapter, but then that context is engulfed by the book, right? So then you look at the wider book. How can you understand what the author is saying within the book itself, right? That's the best place to go, but then it's saying if you still have questions, then you go to the same author in another book. For example, if you're reading in Romans, Paul wrote Romans, And then you can compare what Paul wrote in Romans with what he wrote in Galatians or Ephesians, et cetera, et cetera. Then the further context is looking at the same genre. So Revelation, for example, is uniquely prophetic, and the closest partner to, to Revelation is actually the book of Daniel. So Daniel and Revelation help to unpack and interpret one another. Then we have trying to look within the same testament, and then beyond that, looking at the whole Bible to determine the meaning and interpretation of any given passage. Work from simple to complex, from clear to unclear. Don't try to interpret things that are super complicated before you have a footing in the simple things first. And ask the question, what does this uh, reveal about God and his love? And whatever your conclusion and interpretation is, it must harmonize with the rest of Scripture. Scripture is going to be consistent within itself and not teach two different things. Now let's talk a little bit further about using commentaries and study guides. Let me tell you, friends, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. (laughs) Use the Bible to interpret itself. The Bible comments on itself. That being said, however, we find out from Scripture itself that it's important uh, and helpful to consult 
teachers or pastors or commentaries that help to guide us illuminating along the way. For example, in Nehemiah chapter 8, we read, the leaders helped the people to understand the law. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. So the leaders of Israel helped to instruct the people. This is why you come to church, why you listen to Pastor Doug or other teachers to instruct in what the word of God says. We also have the example from Acts chapter 8, where Philip comes to the Ethiopian eunuch who's reading Isaiah 53. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I, unless someone does what? Guides me. And so Philip helped to interpret and explain the passage that he was reading. We need to be like the good Bereans who are more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. How so? With all readiness, they receive the word. Paul was preaching to them and they said, you know what, this is a good teacher. I'm gonna receive what he has to say. But they also did what? Went back to the Bible to check out what he was teaching. They went back to scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Okay, Pastor Cruz, you're telling me this? That sounds good, but let me go back to the Bible to see if it's true. We need to be checking our pastors out with the Bible, not, uh, excuse, yeah, their pastors out with the Bible, not the Bible out with our pastors. The Bible teaches what my pastor teaches. No, the pastor should be teaching what the Bible teaches. Here are just a few examples of some Bible study guides. You have certain guides that will walk through a book of the Bible. They'll help to navigate and ask certain questions and provide various uh, historical and literary context. You have thematic Bible study guides like our very own Amazing Facts. We have Truthlink. I like that as well. It's more of a narrative approach. And then we have uh, It Is Written Bible study guides. Various topics are very good. There's also a number of helpful books and resources that sometimes we come to thorny passages of Scripture that, that ask very difficult questions, that we can ask very difficult Bible questions, say, what? this is hard to understand. There's books that are written that specialize in answering some of those uh, confusing questions. Furthermore, there is a very helpful website called Biblical Research Institute. This website provides lots of resources um, to help you along your way. And one of my personal favorite resources uh, to help me along the way as I study the Bible is this, is this five volume set called the Conflict of the Ages series. And these are five volumes that are more of a narrative application commentary. That as you're reading scripture, you're reading uh, what the author here is saying, and she does such a good job in helping to illuminate the context and apply the principles to us today. We have uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. This is one of my favorite commentaries to consult, but there's also a new Seventh-day Adventist Bible co Commentary that is under production right now called the International Bible Commentary. We also have the Andrews Bible Commentary. It's a complement to my Andrews Study Bible. It's a two-volume commentary that uh, doesn't cover in as much detail as more commentary sets would. But then you may ask the question, well, what about all the literally dozens and dozens and hundreds of other commentary sets that are out there. There's so many to choose from. Well, two websites that will help you to navigate these commentaries are bestbiblecommentaries.com and bestcommentaries.com. These two websites help to explain what faith background is this author coming from. Evangelical, Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, critical, who is the audience? Is this a commentary for lay people, for scholars, for pastors? These websites are very helpful. And you can find many of these commentaries, most of them actually, on the two most popular Bible software websites, Logos and Accordance. Now, moving on to application. Application, now that you've read the Bible, you've saturated your mind with it, you've interpreted the scriptures, now you look to apply it. And here are some ways we apply scripture. Number one, we need to look for universal principles to apply. Universal principles. We need to ask God, say, God, you need to speak to me directly and apply this passage of scripture to my life or my community's life. And keep in mind that the application may vary depending on what current experience that you are in your life. Another thing to do when you apply scripture is claim the promises of scripture. Every command of God is a promise. All of his biddings are enablings. 
And so, God, I claim the promise that you are with me always, even to the end of the age. Claim various Bible promises. And the last point is to praise God. Amen? Amen. Scripture study should be exciting as we read through. Keep this in mind that information plus application results in transformation. We can't forget to apply the word of God to our lives. Two more texts to go through before we close. Jesus showed up on the road to Emmaus with these two disciples, and these two disciples were discouraged about Jesus dying, and there was Jesus explaining scripture to them. And then they said to themselves, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened scripture to us? This should be our experience, letting God's word burn into our hearts. This is the good kind of heartburn, amen? Let God's word transform your life. And then we have the last and most important key to understanding the Bible, to studying it, is this. Jeremiah tells us, his word is in my heart like a fire. Jeremiah spent the time studying the Bible and it was to him like a burning fire. A fire shut up in his bones, he says, and I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Friends, when we study scripture and we're filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit, we must share it with others. The best way to study scripture is to share scripture. This is what I want to leave you with. May God bless you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we have come to your word and we want to understand it and interpret it correctly. Give us the Holy Spirit to guide us as we study your word according to how it says we should study it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's number 264, Oh For That Flame of Living Fire. for some other time, but our, we'll be starting up again in just a moment. Q&A. 
So stretch a little bit, and we're going to be going live in about uh, 20 seconds or so. And don't forget, if you have a Bible question, I'm going to announce the QR code here when we go live in just a minute. And you can take a picture of that, and you can put your Bible question right there in the system. We've had over 100 questions that have already been submitted. So we'll have a good time answering the questions. All right, you may be seated. We're going to go live in about five seconds. Welcome back, friends, to the Big Bible Summit. We want to welcome all of those who are joining us across the country and around the world. Also, those of you who are here in person. We've had a great time studying through different Bible themes thus far in our summit. We have one final presentation that's going to be taking place now. And then we're going to be taking your Bible questions in our Q&A panel. And that's going to be at 4 o'clock Pacific time. If you have a Bible question... You can actually send that to us by just taking a picture of the QR code. You'll see it on your screen. Or those here in person, you can take a picture of that QR code. You'll be able to post your question right online. And in about an hour, we're going to be answering these various Bible questions. So take advantage of that. We also want to remind you about a free offer that we have for anyone who is watching or those of you in person. You can also take advantage of that. It is the Amazing Facts Bible Symbols Chart. That's one of the offers, and it comes along with a book written by Pastor Doug called The Ultimate Resource. And in order to get this, all you have to do is text the word Bible 777 to the number 40544. That's Bible 777 to the number 40544, and that'll give you access to download these free resources that'll help you in your study of God's Word. Well, we have a theme song that we have been singing through our Bible Summit. This is probably the fifth time that we're going to be singing it. Do you have the words memorized to ancient words? If not, you should. So let's stand as we sing it for our last time, at least live at the beginning of the program, Ancient Words.
Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, once again we are so grateful for your word, grateful for the opportunity to be studying. And Lord, we recognize that the Bible is your book, and in order for us to correctly understand it, we need the leading of the Holy Spirit. So once again, Father, we ask for your Spirit to come and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Our final presentation this afternoon before our Q&A panel will be brought to us by our outreach pastor here at the Granite Bay Church. It's Pastor Jeff Walper, and so we'll turn the time over to him. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Jean. Good afternoon. I uh, trust that you guys aren't sufficiently worn out yet. So I am, um, I am speaking today on the Bible's enduring influence on humanity. Now, that sounds like quite a broad topic, would you agree? And um, I have quite a few slides here, and I doubt that I'll get through all of them. But what I want to share with you today is this concept of endurance. Uh, you know, the word enduring is defined as continuing or long-lasting. You know, uh, the Bible has had a, a long-lasting influence on humanity, in spite of tremendous opposition, tremendous opposition. Uh, influence is defined as the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. And so certainly the Bible is the most powerful um, entity, if you will, or uh, tool to change the character of sinful man into being like Jesus Christ. Um, let's uh, go to our next slide. Is that up there? So number one, the Bible has endured tremendous opposition. Um, I'd like to go to the Bible here. In Romans 8, verse 7, Paul the Apostle, someone that knew something of opposing the Christian church. Um, in fact, he was a murderer or complicit in the death of Stephen, the first martyr, the first Christian martyr. And he writes in Romans 8, 7 that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And so the word enmity is another word for deep hatred, acrimony, deep animus. So the unrenewed heart, the unconverted heart, hates God. That's humanity for you left to himself left to itself. You see, a lot of times people think that Christianity is about taking good people and making them better. That's not what the Bible explains. The Bible says that fallen sinful man is dead in sin. And what Jesus Christ in Scripture offers is that we become a brand new creation by faith in his word. You see, that's a totally different concept than being made better, some, some sort of improvement, new and improved. No, 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 it's a brand new creation, those who come to the word and receive it. And so without Jesus, just know the carnal mind has deep hatred for God. I want to be converted by the word of God on a daily basis. How about you? Yeah, I don't want to have deep hatred for God. I want to be subject to his law by his grace. Also, 1 Corinthians 2.14, I believe Pastor Aaron shared this scripture uh, Paul, again, says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So when I went to State College north of Atlanta in Kennesaw, Georgia, my philosophy professor proceeded to make fun of any Christians in the class. And you know, when you're 19, 20 years old and you have such a reverence or respect for your professor, you want to be like him. And so it's a big deal when you're 18, 19, and your professor is mocking, you know, Christianity. You think, well, I, I don't want to be an idiot. I don't want to be the village idiot and be made fun of here. And so um, God help us to train our young people to withstand ridicule. Amen? To uh, make sure they're pleasing God and not man. Number two, the opposition, this opposition that we're talking about actually began in heaven. This is what the Bible brings out. In Revelation 12, 7 and 8, the Bible says that there was war in heaven. Now, this is before the creation of man. There's war in heaven, and Michael 
and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Hallelujah. <laughs> Aren't you glad that Lucifer or Satan, the adversary, did not prevail against Jesus and his angels? Hallelujah. So there was war in heaven, this war between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels, and the dragon and his angels prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Well, guess where they were cast out? Verse 9 tells us, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, I know that modern intellectuals scoff at the idea of a great controversy between God and Satan. And I know all the intellectuals at university typically scoff at the idea that they are fallen angels. But scripture clearly tells us that Satan and his fallen angels are here on earth. And... Um, we're living down here, and we know the effects of sin, don't we? Um, you know, there's a reason that so much nonsense, one plus one equals three, and two plus two equals eight, and you're like, no, it doesn't. And there's so much deception, so many derivations being promoted constantly, ad nauseum, and you're just like, what is going on? Well, number three, Lucifer's pride is what caused the great controversy. Ezekiel 28 describes what Lucifer was doing in heaven before um, he was finally cast out. Ezekiel 28 says, Moreover, the word of God, more to the Lord, came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, Thou seal up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is a description of Lucifer. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covers. So Lucifer was one of the covering cherubs. You know, we see in the Ark of the Covenant, there's two covering cherubs. Lucifer was one of the top angels in heaven. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked upon, up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So in the presence of the Father. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until what? until iniquity was found in thee. And notice the description of this iniquity, verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled thee, the midst of thee, with violence, and thou hast sinned. It's interesting use of the, the word merchandise. When you think of merchandise, you think of something that's being sold, some sort of commerce. A merchant sells merchandise. And so what Lucifer was doing in heaven in all his self-worship and self-aggrandizement was selling these lies to the angels in heaven about a false concept about God. Some merchandise I don't want to buy. How about you? By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Another interesting English word used here. When we think of merchandise that's being sold, and then we think of traffic, I don't think of cars, I actually think of like a drug dealer. Drug trafficking. So here is Satan, or Lucifer, in heaven, the covering, one of the covering cherubs, 
He's selling this merchandise, these false concepts about God to the angels of heaven. He's trying to spread disaffection. He, he's trying to tell the angels of heaven, I'm not being treated properly, and probably you aren't either. You know, the power of Satan is in his ability to obscure the truth about God's character. But the power of Jesus is in his ability to reveal the truth about God's character. I want to listen to the truth of Jesus Christ. How about you? I do not want to listen to the lies of the enemy. Well, he's selling his merchandise, and by the iniquity of his traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. You know, we have a lot to look forward to, friends. This great controversy is gonna come to an end. And we have trials to pass through as God's faithful followers of the Lamb. But God will be with us. Number four, God creates the world. It's in this context that we find that scripture tells us that God creates the world when there's already this great controversy that's being waged in heaven. Lucifer and his angels are cast down here to earth and then in that context, God creates Adam and Eve. It, well, he creates the world in six days. Then on the sixth day, he creates Adam and Eve. He forms them from the dust of the ground, and then he rests on the Sabbath day. I think it's wonderful that God, the, the crowning act of creation is the Sabbath. We're gonna come to that later. God creates the world. Psalm 33, verse six through nine, we're talking about the word of God this weekend, how important it is to venerate the scripture, how important it is to study the Bible, how important it is to continue in the word. Jesus says in John 8, 31 through 32, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and what will the truth do? The truth will set you free. It's important to tell yourself the truth. And I'm not talking about your own truth or someone else's truth. You know, this whole concept of postmodern, postmodernism where everybody has a version of truth. It's important to allow the scripture to be the authority of your life and to receive the truth of the revelation of God in the person of his son, Jesus. Well, Psalm 33, six through nine tells us, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made in all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. That's a powerful word, would you say? I need that type of word living in me. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. I've been convicted. Sometimes I use the word awesome too freely. I need to use the word awesome to describe Jesus and his word. All the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Hallelujah. John chapter one tells us, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Now the Greeks were really having a hard time when John wrote this. It was the Greco-Roman world then. In the Greek New Testament, John chooses the word logos to describe Jesus. And Logos, in the Greco-Roman philosophical mindset, was this kind of disembodied, um, um, esoteric uh, wisdom that would emanate from some oracle. And so when John uses the word um, Logos to describe Jesus, and then he says the Logos was made flesh, you're like... And the Greeks believed that flesh was just wicked, and the only thing that mattered was this immortal soul, this spirit, woo, you know, and it, it didn't matter what you did in the flesh as long as you ascended to some virtuous truth in your mind. They totally didn't understand the concept of righteousness in action, and um, so when John chooses the word logos to describe Jesus, it's quite interesting. He's kind of you know, being a provocateur to the, the, the Greco-Roman world. And he's saying, in the beginning was the Logos, 
And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So how was everything made? By the word of God, by Jesus. Did you know there's whole movements in the last 150 years, and we're talking about millions of people, whole denominations that deny that Jesus even existed before he was born of Mary? There is a tremendous effort today to try to bring Jesus down to the level of the so-called, what the New Age calls, the masters of every world religion. Friends, Jesus is the creator. The Bible's very clear. He's the creator. And that's significant. (laughs) Talk about an understatement. That's significant because God has given us the Sabbath on a weekly reminder to remember who our maker is. And not only did he rest on the Sabbath day at creation, but he rested on the Sabbath day on the cross. He was was crucified on Friday and put in the tomb on the Sabbath. So he rests both at creation and he rests at redemption. The message is God's work is completed for us at creation and his redemption is completed. What we need to learn is to follow him and his word and by faith become obedient, trusting and obedient to him. I don't know about you, but I am sometimes stubborn, a little slow in my willingness to learn. And the Lord has had to humble me to make me teachable. God help us to be what James says in 317, easily entreated. Number five, man was created in the image of God. I'm gonna bring this out a little bit here. So man is created in the image of God. The Bible describes that we are not like from some primordial goo that was struck by lightning and then we are some sort of single cell amoeba that evolves into homo sapien and then we stand up at homo erectus and we scratch on cave walls. That's not what the Bible describes. The Bible describes that man is made in the image of God. That's quite a beginning, would you agree? We need to prepare our young people because they're going to go to university or they're going to be exposed to this idea that you come from nothing and you're going nowhere, so life has no meaning. I remember I picked up this young man off the side of the highway. He had a big mohawk and he had a big tattoo on his face. You know, when you get tattoos on your face, that's kind of the message of no going back. But if you have a tattoo on your face, God will take you back. Beloved, I don't know what you've been through or what you're going through, but this young man had this big circle in tattooed on his cheekbone, and I picked him up and I said, where are you going? He said, Nashville. I said, well, I can get you halfway there. I said, what's up with the circle in on your face? He said, oh, I'm a nihilist. I said, oh, nihilism. Tell me about it. The concept of Nietzsche, the philosopher, the pastor's kid, albeit. Pray for the pastors and their families. Nietzsche said, God is dead. And this nihilism kind of came out of this concept that people not believing in God, that he is alive and he lives. And this young man proceeded to tell me in this most boyish voice, he was like in his early 20s, and I said, what are you doing out here? He says, I live on the trains. I jump trains and I shoot up heroin. He said, did you come from a rough home? He said, no, I had a good home. I said, your parents know where you are? He said, no. I said, you need to call them. I gave him $20 and the steps to Christ and made him vow to me that he would buy food and not drugs or alcohol. He said he would. But it's very important to know that we're created in the image of God. We have an incredible beginning. We have an incredible future. And we have an incredible meaning in this life because of Jesus. God said, let us make man in our image, our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. I'm gonna say something here. And um, I really believe this. You know, God could have created us any way he wanted to. But just our anatomy tells, there's a message in our body. You know, I've been able to work at a lifestyle center for the last four years, and 
learn how the cells reproduce every so often. And the younger we are, our cells reproduce faster. You know, there's more mercy. There's mercy in, built into us. But as we get older and we're supposed to know better, you know, the cells reproduce a little slower. Don't we know it? I'm uh, at midlife and I'm starting to feel those cells reproducing a little slower. And, uh, but praise God, there's still mercy built in and I'm glad for that. But I think it's interesting that God chose to make man. He formed us from the dirt of the ground, from the clay of the ground, and breathed into our first father, Adam, the breath of life. And he chose to give us two ears in one mouth. Now, he could have put two mouths on the side of our heads. I think that would be some good pop art, you know, someone to do a painting of a person with two mouths and in one ear, because that's more emblematic of what we see in modern culture. But um, God gave us two ears and one mouth. I think the message is clearly this. In God's economy, in God's value system, listening is twice as important as speaking. Perhaps one of the greatest acts of humility is to listen. God help us to be good listeners, especially to the Lord in his word. Well, I've already mentioned it, number six, God gave man two ears and one mouth. Uh, Let's look at the scriptural or the biblical um, implications of that. Romans 10, 17, Paul, again, someone that knew something about being stubborn, kicking against the pricks, Paul says, so then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing from the, or by the word of God. It's important to listen to the word of God. James 1, verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to what? Hear. Hear. You ever been told you're too quick to speak? I had an old, wise elder one time tell me in church, he says, Pastor, I was a brand new pastor quite a while ago, and he said, Pastor, you, uh, you speak up too quickly. He, now he was 80 years old, so he had earned that right. You know, you collect wisdom over the years. And he had been a missionary for a long time. And I said, tell me about it. And he says, you need to slow down. Don't react. Listen before you say anything. And I said, okay, I need help. James 3.17, the Bible says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easily or easy to be entreated. Say it with me. Easy to be entreated. On three. One, two, three. Easy to be entreated. What's the opposite of being easily entreated? Stubborn. This really steps all over my toes. I said, Lord, help me to be easily entreated by your word. Help me to be teachable. I remember my third grade teacher sent my report card home and in the grading system in North Atlanta where I grew up, you you didn't get A's and B's and C's and D's. You got E's and S's and like S plus and S minus and N's. N was like an F. I didn't get an N, but I got an S on follows instruction well. And then I remember a college professor came to me and he says, Jeff, you know, we really like you, the professors, we get together and talk about the students and and the potential that they have, but you know your problem? I said, what's that? He said, you're so unteachable. I said, and as I kind of recall, I don't remember if it was then or later, I started to think of like, well, this is why if you guys would teach, you know, and I just, Thankfully, I didn't say anything. (sighs) You know, there's a time to be stubborn, right? There's a time to, like, not just, like, drink in whatever's being taught. But it's the Word of God, drink it in. Be easily entreated. You know, it's relaxing when you read the Word of God and you don't have to be afraid that you're swallowing a hook. It's like, oh, good. You know, it's peaceful. There's not like some hand behind its back like trying to get you. 
The, the Lord's like, no, it's an embrace I want to give you. Number seven, God gives man the Sabbath at creation. Now, this is significant. Genesis 2, 1 through 3, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. Excuse me, on the I was looking at the clock. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that the first full day God gives man is a day of rest? Isn't that nice? It's just, you know, the, he makes paradise, and then he, he gives... Adam, a woman, a, a, a helpmate comparable to him, and then he says, now, first day, you get the day off. We're just, we're just going to rest on the Sabbath, and we're going to commune together. And I imagine they probably went through a nature walk, and God just like, they enjoyed communion face to face. You know, the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, at the last chapter, the last verses in the book of Isaiah says, in the new heavens and the new earth, we're going to come together on every Sabbath day. You know, if, if the Sabbath was at creation and the Sabbath is in the new heavens and the new earth, then why wouldn't the Sabbath mean something now? We're not saved by obedience to the law. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, but we're judged by our works. And Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, so I want to kind of bring out just how much opposition just the creation week has endured. Um, There's been all sorts of theories since textual or or higher criticism has arrived in the, what, the 18th century? And they are now questioning that there wasn't really literal seven days there was gaps of billions of years between day, this day and that day, and the creation week doesn't really mean anything. You know, in the French Revolution, to try to be an affront to the Bible, an affront to Christianity, they just decided to get rid of the seven-day week. You know, every bit of time, every demarcation of time is based on physical science, physical law. You know, the earth, how long does it take for the earth to rotate one time on its axis? I should tilt it after the flood. So how long does it take for the earth to spin? One time. 24 hours. And then while the earth is spinning one time every 24 hours, how long does it take um, for there to be a month? What's the demarcation of physical science that gives us a month? So while the earth is spinning on its axis, giving us a day for every 24 hours, the moon is spinning around the earth once every 30 days, approximately. And then, and then, so we get the concept of days and months, and then how long does it take for the earth, while all this spinning is going around, uh, to go around the sun? The Jewish calendar would tell us about 360 days. Now it's 365 days, but you get the idea. So it takes about 365 days, give or take, to, for the earth to go around the sun. And you can break all that down into minutes, into seconds, into hours, and all that. But here's a question. Why a seven-day week? There's nothing in science, there's no physical law in the world that says, ha, ah, seven days. It's not there. So it begs the question to the intellectually honest atheist, Hey, why are we have seven days every week? Creation. Talk about an enduring influence on humanity. The scripture, we still have seven days a week, don't we? And so the atheist can rage against the scripture and mock the young student and be a bully and be pretty proud of himself or herself as he denigrates and makes fun of the little student that is insecure and trying to establish his identity or her identity and and then, you know, make him lose his faith. But he still counts time seven days a week. I just love that. And the seven-day week 
is significant because we see both at the French Revolution, they tried to make it 10 days, and then at the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, they tried to, they, they changed it up, they went to five days. And uh, both times it didn't last. And if you look at almost every language, the seventh day is almost translated in almost every language as some version of Shabbat or Sabbath. I love that. I love that. That just makes me smile. That's enduring influence of the scripture on humanity. Well, Adam and Eve, um, we find rebel and sin against God. I'm going to have to move through this quickly. We're told that the serpent is more subtle than any of the beasts of the field, and now his trafficking and his merchandise that he was selling in heaven, he now brings his derivations to man. And he starts with Eve, and he suggests to her, subtly, albeit, um, has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice the subtle implication the serpent is trying to suggest that somehow that God is capricious, that God is arbitrary. And he's trying to make God look um, like he's holding out on Eve. When in fact, the Lord had just told them, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, just not one tree. Now can you imagine a government that only has one law? You know, how does the Bible influence humanity? James Madison, one of the founding fathers of this country, said the government that governs the least is the best. That's a Christian concept. You want to raise your children to be obedient, you give them a few consistent rules that you're not being a hypocrite with, but you're living up to it yourself, and they're fair, and it's ideal to live out in the country where you can tell them yes all the time. Hey, Dad, can I go outside? Yeah, go outside. Go play with the dog and the chickens and jump on the trampoline. You're not living in, a, in the city, you know, and like, oh, no, you can't go outside. No, you know, and you're able to tell your children yes all the time, and then when you tell them no, it's reasonable few times like well no like well, let's consider this this is one of the first revelations of God's character is that his government is fair and it's not capricious it's not onerous it's not tons of rules for a youngest sibling I love this concept of God you see you give me too many rules and I just there's something in me it's almost visceral it's like uh, you know yeah Lord help me to just not be rebellious um Well, the serpent tried to trick Eve with a false concept of God as he's trafficking his merchandise now on earth. Um, Has God said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman speaks to the serpent. Not a good idea. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God has said you should not eat of it, lest neither shall you touch it, lest you die. You know the story, the serpent says to the woman, you shall not surely die. And we still have this concept, this lie that's going around that wicked people live eternally in a lake of fire, even right now, and God somehow enjoys it, otherwise he wouldn't allow it. And that's a whole other study, but those who don't give their life to Jesus, they perish. There's not eternal torment, and that's a whole other study, but that false concepts about God makes God worse. It makes, in, in the mind of, of, of people that it really dig into that, like, well, now, wait a second, I thought Hitler was wicked, and he was. But God is torturing people in hell for eternity? Well, they only, they only live to be 30. Doesn't seem like justice. It's such a relief to find out the Bible doesn't teach that. Yeah. Oh, my Lord, talk about a relief. You can follow God from a motivation of love and not confused fear. Uh. Well, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. That's a lie. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Another lie. It's interesting. There's a concept that's been rolled out, and I was confronting this in some of my training, um, 
of a, a, of a new Jesus Christ. There was a French Jesuit in 1952 named Teilhard de Chardin that said we need to come up with a new Jesus Christ because that's the only way we're going to unite all the world religions. And, and um, Teilhard de Chardin is considered like the father of the new age. This is not like some people selling crystals at the flea market. This is people in high places. And he came up with this new Jesus Christ called the Cosmic Christ. And he said that the world is going to evolve to a point where mankind realizes that they are deity. He called it the Omega Point. And when mankind realizes that they are God, then the great, he called him the, the great Cosmic Christ is gonna come and unify all world religions. And you think, well, phew, I'm so glad that's not, that hasn't caught on. It's actually heavily represented in the UN. It's, it, it, this is not conspiracy theory. This is just what we're dealing with in our world today. This opposition to scripture. Friends, there's one way to the Father. His name is Jesus. It's not multiple choice. Jesus is not some master on the level of all the other world religions. He's the Son of God. There's only one way back to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus, through the blood atonement of the Lamb of God. And um, we should never apologize for that. Now, preach it in love, but preach it, please, teach it. Well, I'm going to have to move on quicker. Um, Number eight, sinful man is afraid of God's word. So what's the result of sin? Now we see that sinful man is afraid of God's word. This is very important because early we read in Romans 8, 7 that the carnal man is enmity with God. And now we see, you want to see, what does sinful man look like as soon as he sins? Adam and Eve give evidence of this as soon as God pursues them in the garden in, in Genesis chapter 3. God comes in the garden in the cool of the day, in the morning, he says, Adam, where are you? Now, God knew where Adam was. It was kind of a rhetorical question. And um, I think sometimes God asks us questions for us to consider ourselves, like, you know, where am I? How did I get here? How did I get like this? He knows where we are. He knows how we got there, but sometimes, you know, we need to consider. And... Um, Number eight, sinful man is now afraid of God's word and hides from his presence. We read about this in Genesis 3. The Bible says in verse eight, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. Now, I know today we live in a culture that says, you know, don't body shame me. I can be naked and be unashamed about that. But, you know, once that lie subsides and people still deal with the, the shame of sin that we all have faced, you know, it, it, it strips our dignity from us. That's what sin does. And um, we all have been victimized by it. But praise God, Jesus came to empower us and to save us. He doesn't want us to be victims. He wants to cover our shame. Hallelujah. He doesn't want to expose us and get, the, and get the whole class laughing at us. He covers our shame. And um, number nine, it should be, sinful man is now proud and self-worshipping. We get evidence of this. Jesus says in the scripture that out of the abundance of the heart, what does the mouth do? And so we get evidence of what sinful man is like almost immediately. Verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree where have I commanded that you shouldn't eat? And the man said, well, I take full responsibility for this. <laughs> you want to talk about a loss of dignity. What kind of a sniveling position is a man in to throw his wife under the bus, and then God as well in the whole process. I've just described to you not only Western civilization, but the whole world for the past 6,000 years. 
because this is what fallen man does. The unrenewed heart, the unconverted heart, will not take responsibility. It will exalt self at the expense of those closest to them. This is what pride and self-worship looks like. It's hard for love to grow in that type of a construct. Hast thou eaten of the tree that I commanded that you should not eat? And the man said, it's the woman who you gave to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman, not much better, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So later in the book of Exodus, we're going to get the revelation of the law of God, the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The last six deal with our relationship with our fellow man. And notice that Adam says, this woman who you gave me, you gave me. I can't be held responsible for this. Hey, God, do a better job. Get me a better wife. And hey, this woman. And that's basically what unconverted men still do to this day. That's why we need to be converted on a daily basis. To love our wives like Christ loves the church with an unconditional love. And give ourselves. You know, you can't be a generous giver unless you see the generous heart of the Father that he gave Jesus. You know, we all at our default have a mentality of scarcity. But God wants to divest us of that scarcity mentality and give us a mentality of abundance that we can give. You can't give what you don't have. God help us to receive the gospel from the word. Well, number nine, the first gospel promise from God to man is made. God tells the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all the cattle, above all the beasts of the field. Time is going. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so ever since this time, you have two groups of people. You have those who are the seed of the woman. Ultimately, Jesus would be born of woman. That would be the church, the Christian church who followed the word of God. And then those who don't, the seed of the serpent. I've heard some people say, and I've done this before, well, everybody is a child of God. That's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, later we're going to look at it, and I don't know if we're going to have time, but John chapter 8, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders in his day, right around verses 37 to 44, and they're all arguing with him. They're Pharisees. They're, they're teachers of the law. And they're trying to kill Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, if you'll continue in my word, then you'll be my disciple and you'll be free. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And they say, well, we've never been in prison to anybody. I mean, they're, they're, they're a subject territory to the Roman, <laughs> you know, the Roman government. I mean, talking about delusion um, or being deluded. You know, it's scary sometimes how we can kid ourselves, not be honest with ourselves. And... Um, they said, we've never been in prison to anybody. And he says, oh. He says, well, whoever commits sin is a slave to it. And they're still arguing how they're so righteous and he doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, he's, he's God. And then he tells them, he says, look, you're of your father. And uh, why, can't, why don't you listen to me? It's because my word has no place in you. And that's actually why you seek to kill me. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to his law, neither indeed can it be. And they said, well, we're not born of fornication. Now they're really trying to get at him because they know he's the son of the carpenter and, and Mary, his mother, was pregnant before the marriage was, you know, and, and, and the rumor mill had it that Jesus was some illegitimate child. They didn't believe in the whole concept that, that Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. So then they say, well, we're not born of fornication. And they're quite proud of themselves. And they're legalese. And he says, look, you are of your father, the devil. In his lusts, you will do. And you, this is why you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. In the lusts of your father, that's what you're going to do. 
Whoa. So the distinguishing characteristic between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent is quite simply the reception of the word of God. And we sadly see this almost immediately in Genesis 4 where Cain and Abel are both worshiping God. One worships the fruit of his own labor and the other worships the lamb. God accepts Abel's worship of the lamb. Cain gets jealous and in anger he hits his brother, and kills him. And that enmity has been repeated again and again and again ever since. The seed of the serpent who rejects the word of God will eventually be, given the opportunity and the need, will be the aggressor against the seed of the woman. History has revealed to us millions and millions and millions, 50 million Russian Orthodox and 50 million Spanish Inquisition, and on and on and on it goes. Those who want to read the Bible, you know what the Latin word heresy means? To choose for yourself. Secular historians call, us, call the time when the earth didn't have the Bible, of course they don't call it this, but it's still called the Dark Ages. Over a thousand years the world did not have the scripture. But once the Bible came out, and Luther writes it in German, Tyndale in English, Johann Gutenberg makes the, the printing press, and the Bible explodes to the common person, and they all have access to it, it changes everything. Amen. The monarchies became Protestant. They started reading their Bibles. It's a fascinating history. There's a book called Ecclesiastical Megalomania by Robbins that details the history of when a critical mass of people in the 1500s and 1600s received the scripture and what it did to them. The monarchy started to give people freedom to have land rights. You could own land. And then people quit dying at 35 and 40 and they started wanting to work harder and they started learning who God was. And they developed a work ethic. And then there was a huge collection of wealth in these European countries that had the scripture. They had land rights, they had property rights, and um, it was fascinating. You, it's a fascinating study. 19, the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, you see the word of God <laughs> rising. And the world is coming out of the dark ages. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse 130, um, the entrance of thy word gives light. Two and a half minutes. You know, the implications of the scripture and the gospel given to man has been nothing short of revolution, revolutionary. Um, a very simple tenet is this. You will act out on other people your picture of God. It's true. If you feel condemned by God, you will be a critical person. But if your heart is at peace with God, you accept the promises of Scripture, you accept the gospel, you accept the blood of Jesus on your behalf, and you surrender your life, and you have peace, goodwill from the Father and the person of Jesus, then you'll be able to give that to others. And you won't have to be in first place. It'll be okay to be humble and just a servant. The Scripture has had a profound impact on the world in health, People, you have the, the health care, people started to help um, without interest of money. This is history. Um, you have uh, education, literacy, ex it exploded. People started to read the Bibles, people were encouraged to read. It had tremendous impact on society. People started learning about um, uh, hygiene, Started reading Leviticus and how to take, how to have proper water, you know, uh, you need to deal with your waste over here and have clean water and, and we should put the dead over there and, and it changed people. I want to give you some homework. I encourage you to go on YouTube this afternoon or tomorrow and Google or YouTube the Kim Yall people receiving the scripture in their own language. Kim Yall, K-I-M-Y-A-L. It's such a touching video. The Kim Yall people were neighbors to the Papua Nguyen people. 
the cannibals. And this culture didn't have the word of God. And, you know, humanity will degrade without a knowledge of God. But once they receive the word of God, no longer headhunters. Now they're on fire for Jesus. They're learning how to love. They're learning how to live. It's such a fascinating um, video. I encourage you to watch it. I wish I had another hour, but I don't. Friends, the Bible has endured much opposition. God help us to be easily entreated. And may God's voice not find any opposition in us. Amen? God's word will accomplish that which he sent forth to accomplish. Our salvation. Our transformation back into the image of God. Let's pray. Loving Father, I want to just praise you for Jesus, the word. Thank you that the word was made flesh. Lord, the implications of Jesus being given to the human race and the word coming to communicate to us the message of the gospel, the message of the Father of peace and goodwill is nothing short of transformative. We pray that we would be easily entreated. We would humble ourselves and be quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to obey, slow to rebel. Help us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends.
Maranatha. And welcome everybody to uh, this final segment of our Big Bible Summit. How many of you have been enjoying yourselves this afternoon? How many of you have learned a lot, right? Amen. Praise God for this seminar. We want to thank all of our speakers, which are, of course, the Granite Bay Hilltop pastors. And we want to thank everybody that's here in person, everybody that's watching online. And we're going to come to what most people consider their favorite part, which is the Q&A section, right? Where people have been throwing. We've been getting a lot, a lot of questions. We have over 100 questions, right? So what we've done is we've organized them for this, each topic. And then there's a general section topic, which I don't think we're going to be able to get to. But we're going to try as hard as possible to get through these questions as quickly as possible, but concisely and precisely. Amen? And so we want to thank everybody again for being here. And so let's start off our Q&A with a word of prayer. Pastor Sean, would you pre please lead us out in a word of prayer? Father God, we want to... God, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to continue to study this great book that you have given to us. We thank you so much for all the rich information that you've shared uh, over the last uh, uh, 16 hours or 20 hours or so. And, and Lord, as we continue to uh, consider your word, we want to pray that you'll help us to can all grow, uh, both us as pastors here on the panel, as well as those who are joining us here today, that we can all grow in the knowledge of your word. Please bless us with your Holy Spirit and teach us. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right. Very good. So we're going to start off with our first question. And the first question is for Pastor Lucas. Pastor Lucas, you said Jesus was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. How can you prove this biblically? Well, when you read... <laughs> that's a good question. Um, when you read the, the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 8 you'll see that Adam and Eve, when they had just eaten of the fruit, and, um, and then the text tells us they hear God walking through the garden and approaching them. When that text is read in its original Hebrew text, the inference is that this is something very familiar to them. It's not something out of the ordinary. It's not unexpected. It catches them by surprise. And so the inference is that this is something that was, that was common to them. He used, this was something that was, that as, as was his custom, he would come in the cool of the day um, and he would walk with them and teach them and converse with them. Additionally, when you, when you read the, the creation of, of humans, of, you know, of mankind, you'll see that God there, he allows Adam to name the animals. He comes to Adam when Adam, in, when Adam notices that he doesn't have a companion that is likened to him, and then he puts him into a deep sleep. So you see that the, the, the connection between God and humans was very close. God didn't create them and then just abandon them and let them there, or, you know, doing nothing. No, God conversed with them. He came and he walked with them. And so I believe that that example in Genesis 3, verse 8, to me, it's, the, uh, it's one of the strongest um, arguments or reasons to believe that Jesus would come and talk and walk and instruct them. All right, very good. Pastor Sean, how can you confirm that Daniel was alive during the time of the Neo-Babylonian Empire? Uh, yeah, Daniel is a uh, key figure of, of history, and of course we looked at that during our presentation last night. And, uh, and Daniel was the one that God gave the furthest reaching prophecies to. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's interesting because uh, Daniel, there's a lot of critics that have said, well, there's no way that somebody could, could uh, uh, predict the future that far ahead. And so they have tried to push Daniel's character and his actual life further into the future that he actually lived. So where did Daniel live and when did he live? Well, it says in the book of Daniel that he lived in the uh, Neo or the Neo Babylonian Empire, which existed between 605 BC and, and 539 uh, BC as well. So uh, the first thing we'd have to do is deny that the actual scripture that is written in Daniel was, was true. In other words, it's a, it's, the whole thing is a scam. It's a, it's a falsehood uh, because the author claims to be a character that actually lived during that time. So we have to decide, was the words of that book actually accurate and uh, honest? or was it not? So that's the first decision they have to make to be able to, to decide whether or not Daniel was actually living during that time. Uh, most critics have pushed, tried to push Daniel's existence up to about the time of the Maccabees, about 200 BC, 
And, uh, and so they say, well, you know, the only reason that he knew Persia and Greeks and so on would come up onto the scene is because, well, it already happened. And so he was falsely trying to, again, in a dishonest way, claim that he lived back in Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon's day, but actually didn't. Uh, the only problem with that current most popular theory by many critics, even within Christian or biblical scholastics that are kind of uh, uh, more destructive in their view on the Bible than helpful or constructive is that the vast majority of the prophecies still go far beyond 200 BC. So they try to kick the can down the road, you know, 400 years further into Daniel's actual, exi actual existence, but that still doesn't really put them in a full, uh, uh, sp the spot that they really want to be, and, and that is that Daniel, again, Daniel's prophecies go far beyond 200 uh, BC. And so when you look at all the evidence, uh, I think that it's actually quite uh, uh, substantial for us to say no. I think that the book was honest. I don't think that it was deceptive in its, in its, in its uh, approach. And, uh, and again, um, you know, you'd have to put Daniel past our day. Uh, you'd have to push him further into the existence than we are because his prophecies are still being fulfilled today and there's still parts that are going to be fulfilled in the future. All right. Thank you. You know, Carlos, maybe let, let me add one more thing. Um, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, 1940, they found portions of every Old Testament book except the book of Esther. And uh, those parchments, those manuscripts were dated to about 120, some of them dated to about 125 BC, which means by 125, the book of Daniel, which is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, was accepted as being a prophetic book written by Daniel. So for them to try to push it back to around 200 BC, uh, that's not reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's another evidence. I love having the last word on this. <laughs> Ezekiel says, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, Ezekiel recognized Daniel, and he lived during the Persian, uh, well, probably later Babylonian time. So it's silly to try. You have to also get rid of the book of Ezekiel if you don't think Daniel's real. Amen. And Jesus did too in Matthew 24. Yeah. Amen. Very good. Pastor John Ross, is the chiastic structure of the Bible affected by the various versions and translations? Yes, just a real briefly, chiastic structure is something that you see in the prophetic portions of the book, but also in the Psalms and some of the Proverbs. It's a form of Hebrew writing or Hebrew style of poetry. Um, if you want to get the full impact of, a chiast of the chiastic structure of a Psalm, perhaps, one of the prophetic passages, it is helpful to go back to the original language. And chiasm, in a nutshell, is you'll have theme A and theme B, and then you'll have theme B match, and theme A will match. So it's almost like a pyramid, and each side of the pyramid has its corresponding theme that's matched on the other side. It uses different language, the different words, but it talks about the same subject. And then the central focal point of the chiastic structure is usually the main point or the main theme that the writer is trying to emphasize. So you can see a little of that in English, but really if you go back to the original languages, you really get a good feeling of the chiastic structure. It doesn't mean you have to know Hebrew or Greek. You can go back to some good concordances or some good commentaries, and that'll actually help guide you in the chiastic structure. The entire book of Revelation, incidentally, is written in a chiastic structure. And just on a side note, the pinnacle of that chiastic structure in the book of Revelation is the three angels' messages. They're very interesting, Revelation 14. So anyway, that, that's a deeper, fuller study on the chiastic structure. Amen. Pastor Doug, if the writers of the 66 books determined they were uh, writers, messengers of God, who determined that the other books not in the Bible aren't of God, such as the book of Enoch and other books? Yeah, if you have ever looked at a Catholic Bible, you'll notice that in the Catholic Old Testament, they've got a series of apocryphal books like Maccabees and some others, and um, which um, have not been included in the uh, Protestant or Jewish typical canon of scripture, and that's because uh, they're of dubious origin. Now, the Maccabees probably have some good historical information in them, but uh, as far as the inspirational value, um, the other prophetic writers did not recognize it. Now, you will hear where uh, Jude quotes from the book of Enoch, and some said, well, if Jude quotes from the book of Enoch, doesn't that mean that it's all inspired? 
No, Paul quotes from Greek, uh, Greek poets. And so it just means that there was a statement in this book of Enoch that Jude thought should be repeated that was inspired, and so he quoted from that statement. But um, just because an ex excerpt of a book may be prophetic doesn't mean the whole book is prophetic. All right. Pastor Aaron, which Bible app do you think is the best one to use for Bible study? Yeah, well, if you uh, listen to my presentation, I highlighted uh, my favorite Bible app multiple times, and that is the Blue Letter Bible. I'm telling you, it's the best. Go download it right now. Bookmark it on your website. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's not a spokesman for them. <laughs> <laughs> I get no royalties, nothing, but uh, I've used it for years. I know so many people. It's got just the concordance on there is my favorite. You can look up a word, its meaning, show where it, uh, look up where it, all the places used in the Bible. It has tons of Bible translation, translations on there, many of which you can use offline, so you don't have to be dependent on Wi-Fi or whatever. So blue letter Bible, get it. All right. Pastor Jeff, yes. the Bible says we are to work six days. Does that mean we can't take vacations or take off holidays? Because if we are on vacation, we wouldn't be able to work six days. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think it's fine to take a vacation. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, we have to remember that the Bible does say work six days. As much as it's a commandment to rest on the Sabbath day, we should work six days. And now I know we live in a culture where people overwork. You know, we tend to be intemperate in many things, whether it's food or recreate, or I shouldn't call it recreation, entertainment, games, and work. And so, um, yeah, I think it's fun to take a vacation. Yeah. And I'm for vacations. If, go ahead, Lucas. If I could just add, the point of the text is not the work week. The point of the text is the Sabbath. So in answering, in, in, in telling us to work the six days, he's just saying that if you're going to work, do it on the six days. It has nothing to do with you have to work the six days. The point is the Sabbath, not the other six days. Yes. And yeah. Jesus took his disciples on retreats, right? So family retreat in that way. Swimming around in the Jordan. Yeah, exactly. Like Lucas was. But if, Luke, you're, if, if you're resting all week, sometimes the Sabbath, you know, you need to look forward to the Sabbath. Amen. So. Lucas, who was the author of the Gospel of Mark? Do we have any evidence that the Apostle Peter dictated it or it was written from his words? So this is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, conversation again uh, among the academics, the scholars about this, you know, the auth not only when it comes to the book of Mark, but several other books of the Bible. The Gospel of Mark, um, traditionally believed to, be have, to have been written by John Mark, and uh, who was not an eyewitness of most of the things that happened there uh, with Jesus and the disciples. But there is a tradition in the early church uh, phase that comes from, I believe it was Papias, and where he directly says, this is the second century, um, he is uh, you know, one of the church fathers, or a disciple of a disciple of a disciple, basically. And he, um, he mentions that it was the apostle uh, Peter that was dictating the, the letter or the, the gospel to John Mark. Additionally, Eusebius, he also makes a reference that Mark and Peter, or John Mark and Peter, were very close to each other. They, they had trips together and all that. And so it's reasonable to believe that um, John Mark, he is receiving uh, dictation from, from the Apostle Peter. An additional reason for this is because when you read the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that Peter is always portrayed in a negative light. And so it was their custom. You'll see that, for example, in the Gospel of John. John doesn't really use that, his name that much. He doesn't refer to himself in the first person. He says the beloved apostle, right? And you'll have uh, instances where he's portrayed in negative light as well. So in the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that Peter is portrayed in negative light. That's common of these biblical authors. Um, so these are the reasons. I find them reasonable. There's also a very big uh, correlation between the vocabulary that you find in First and Second Peter and the Gospel of Mark. So there are these reasons for that. It's nothing certain. You could, you know, speculate. In any case, I love the Gospel of Mark. It's one of my favorite Gospels. And uh, be that Peter, be that Mark, I believe that it portrays Jesus Christ in a beautiful light. All right. Pastor Sean, how can you discuss the veracity of the Bible with a Muslim when they do not believe in Jesus or the Holy Spirit? 
Sorry, repeat the question again. How can we discuss the veracity of the Bible with a Muslim when they do not believe in Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Well, I mean, to, to be able to understand the, the, the truth of the scriptures on some of these things, you have to accept the truth of the teaching of the actual scriptures themselves. So if they are not open to discuss the, the evidences, for, for instance, or the testimony of the scriptures and concerns the divinity of Christ, the, the, the redemption that Christ has actually accomplished through his death on the cross, his resurrection, his intercession. You know, some of these essential elements of salvation, the existence of the Holy Spirit and so on, then um, you're, kind of, you're kind of at a stalemate, you know, um, because some of these things we have to accept by faith, you know, because Jesus had said to Thomas, you know, you have seen, you have handled me, you have put your hand in my side and so on because you would not believe until then. But blessed are those who have not seen, but yet they still believe. And, uh, and so, you know, if, if, if somebody of a different faith is not willing to discuss some of the testimonies of the scriptures, uh, a lot of what the scriptures present to us, we weren't there. I have, I've never seen Jesus. I wasn't at the cross. I, wasn't, I never saw an empty tomb. Uh, I, we don't even know for sure where his tomb was, uh, you know, so there's a couple of traditional uh, locations for it and so on. So there's a number of things that Jesus tells us that we have to be able to consider and, and allow that Holy Spirit that you're talking about to convict us of some of these different things that the, the scriptures testify of. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. Go I ahead, don't, Lucas. Th that's, there's a, the, an, additionally, there, um, there's a lot that the that they will agree or that they will agree with you. So, for example, they believe that Jesus was uh, the greatest prophet. But the only source that you have about Jesus, speaking about Jesus historically, is the Bible. So you'll have to go to the Bible, and they'll have to come to your, you know, have a conversation of coming from the Bible because it's the only historical source that speaks about Jesus in that way, and there Jesus clearly connects himself with uh, with uh, deity, right, with being God. So that's a good starting place, perhaps, is their belief that Jesus was a prophet, uh, the greatest prophet, but in the source that mentions Jesus, it doesn't consider him a prophet at all. It considers him God. So that's where I would begin with that, in addition to what Pastor John said. All right. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, Pastor John, <clears throat> I would like to know what is the best Hebrew slash Greek slash English Bible would be to study the Bible in its, in, in its original language. Okay, well, if you know the original languages, there's probably many different uh, sources and, and places you could go. If you don't know the original languages, one of the best ways, at least that I like to use, is a good concordance, because you can actually look up the original word in the Hebrew or in the Greek, and you can see where that word is used in the original Old Testament or New Testament. So a good concordance will give you a good grounding. It will also give you a definition for what that word is. Is there one Hebrew source or one Greek source that is greater than the other? I don't think so. Remember, there are many different Greek manuscripts available. Whether you're talking about the Byzantine family of texts or the Alexandrian or the Western, there are many different uh, manuscripts available. Are you talking about the Old Testament? You've got the... Um, the majority text or the Masoretic text, as it's referred to. You've also got the Dead Sea Scrolls that are also another source of Old Testament text. So you want to compare. You want to look at different uh, various manuscripts, and a good concordance will really do the trick to guide you into a deeper and clearer understanding of what the Bible is saying. All right. Thank you. Pastor Doug, can you explain how the canon of Scripture was chosen? Did Constantine have anything to do with picking which books were added to the canon? Well, I answer the second part first. No, Constantine had nothing to do with picking them. Constantine did commission that 50 translations of the Bible should be uh, circulated. You know, Constantine's mother became a, a Christian. And so he did commission uh, 50 translations of the Bible, and that included the 27 books but by the time of Constantine, those books had long since been established as the authoritative canon. What did happen probably is those 50 Bibles that Constantine commissioned may be the first time that the Bibles were bound together, the Old and New Testament. Up until then, they'd have the scrolls of the Old Testament, the scrolls in the New Testament. 
but uh, they believe that Constantine's order for the 50 translations put them together for the first time in what we see now as our Bible. But uh, how were they chosen? Um, uh, church leaders long before the time of Constantine were cross-referencing and endorsing or the early church fathers, some that knew the Apostle John. I understand that you know by the time of Justin Martyr or uh, some of the other church fathers that lived 150 years after Christ, keep in mind, John lived to like 90 AD. So their lives overlapped with someone who had firsthand knowledge of Jesus. They had endorsed the 27 books that we have in the New Testament. Some were contesting the book of James, even as far as Martin Luther. But even Luther put it in the Protestant Bible. And that's because Luther struggled with James talking about faith and works, where Luther was really big on just faith. All right, thank you. Pastor Aaron, how do we know God's promises are meant for us in the present and weren't just for the person he was speaking to back then at that time? Yeah, that's a really great question, really important question. Um, and the biggest thing to consider, of course, is context, right? There's lots of promises given in Scripture, the sums that are given uh, a promise to King David, a promise to the nation of Israel, a promise that Jesus said to his disciples, whatever it may be. And you have to be careful to analyze the context of that promise. Some promises have a very clear, universal, direct, one-for-one -one application, right? From the Bible times to today. Uh, like, for example, Jesus said in Matthew 28 at the end, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, right? That, that's a pretty universal to all of Jesus's followers. Uh, there's other promises that are directly to the nation of Israel or directly to certain people or things like that, that you have to take a few steps of interpretation. Uh, but one of my favorite, um, one major principle to, to keep this quick is in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 in verse 20, Paul writes that all the promises of God in him, that is in Jesus, are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So many of the promises that are given in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel, when we understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel, right, that those promises are fulfilled for Israel in Jesus, through Jesus, and then apply to us who are modern-day spiritual Israel, right? So there is a bit of a process uh, in, in some promises that have to be sort of followed through and contextualized. Um, but yeah, try to look at the clearest, most obvious ones, right? Like one of my, my favorite prom one of my favorite promises, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Um, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean on your, on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And what's the promise? And he will direct your paths, right? That's all time, all places. Trust in him and he'll direct you. Amen. Pastor Jeff, why did God create Adam first and then wait to create Eve? Save the best for last. <laughs> uh, why did God create Adam first? I don't know. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think, you know, he made man in his own image, and then he takes Eve, a rib from Adam's side, and then he makes woman to be a helpmate comparable to him. Um, why did he make man first? I don't know. Can I answer? Please. I've heard it said. <laughs> Save the best for last. That in creation, no, this is true. <laughs> You'll notice that God makes things increasingly more complex, starting, isn't that right? And finally, the, the, the greatest complexity was the, the last creature. <laughs> so. I, I, would, I would just add, he saved the best for last. <laughs> here, here. All right. <laughs> I'll throw my 10 cents in there. I think that when God tells Adam to name the animals and he starts seeing that there's female, male, male, female, mm. it kind of put in Adam his desire to want to have his own companion. Well, everybody else has a companion. Right. What about me, right? Mm. And so then God gives him the desire of his heart to have companionship. So, But I like Pastor Doug's answer better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, Lucas, Lucas, you referred in your presentation to special revelation and also the revelation of Jesus. But as two types of revelation, but aren't they really one and in the same? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I believe that what I was trying to do is to draw out the most glorious aspect of specific revelation, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, you could read the whole Bible, and if you don't add the, cal the catalyst, which is Jesus Christ, you can read all of it and not get the point, because he's the point. So, yes, yeah, special revelation, Jesus Christ, of course. It's God giving us what we would never know with, without him revealing it to us. But I do like to draw a distinction, which is, uh, you know, special revelation when it, come, when it comes to the written word is one thing. And I think that Pastor Sean very, you know, beautifully placed this yesterday, that uh, Jesus Christ, he is the word made flesh. So, even though we have the written word and we have the word made flesh, they, they come together in this magnificent way where Jesus, he reflects the, word, the written word and the written word reflects Jesus Christ. So yeah, they're both the one and the same. At the same time, I like to draw the line that Jesus Christ is the most magnificent, the most beautiful, and the most um, the clearest revelation coming from God. All right, thank you. Pastor Sean, our formal names like Elizabeth... Don't change much, no matter what the language are. How do you explain the change of the father and the son's name, not titles in other languages? Uh, yeah, that is. Uh, to, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure where the where the person is is what the person is asking uh, in relationship to name changes. I can take a guess, and uh, hopefully, I'll Something. get it right. So please forgive me. But I'm guessing that the person is referring to the fact that when we look at the English translation in particular, we have a number of titles for God. We have Elohim and et cetera that are, are generic titles or terms for God. And, uh, and those are used for terms in, in other uh, applications as well. But when you look at the actual name of God, such as Yahweh or, or the traditional Christian version of that is, is, is a conglomeration of a couple of different titles of Jesus, Jehovah and, and such, is that uh, the English translators uh, have taken a tradition many years ago that when you come to that name, rather than uh, put Jehovah or Yahweh and some of these other uh, attempts that we've had to try to you know, to spell and to pronounce the original name of God that he gave to Moses in particular, which is the great I am, that they just put capital L-O-R-D. And so whenever you see in the English translations, capital O, capital O, capital L, I should say, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is uh, an indication for us. And if you are one of the rare ones that have read the introduction to your English translation, the first pages, the actual translators point that out for you. And so uh, it, it's a title, Lord is a title, but it also is an indication for us in the English translations that it's also referring to the name Yahweh or Jehovah, and again, these are just guesses at how the actual original name that God gave to Moses was pronounced, because they only had consonants, consonants that they used uh, back then, and, uh, and so what the vowels were in between, we're not quite sure. Yeah, so I hope that helps a little bit. Yes. Pastor John Ross, it was said that the Alexandrian text was potentially omitting texts regarding the Trinity slash Godhead because of Arian beliefs. How can we then trust the Alexandrian text? Well, as you mentioned a little earlier, when you're looking at the various, uh, and mostly it's New Testament, uh, pretty much the Old Testament is, is uh, you know, fairly agreed upon. Uh, but when it comes to the New Testament and the three clusters of different types of Greek manuscripts, the Western, the Byzantine, the Alexandrian, each of them are a little bit different. Um, and I guess the question one needs to consider about trustworthiness of the manuscript there's two lines of thought. Either you're gonna go with the quantity of manuscripts, or you're gonna go with the age of a manuscript. So if you're looking for the oldest Greek manuscripts, then you're gonna end up with some of the Alexandrian text, because they date the oldest. However, you have less. The older you go, the less manuscripts are available, and you become more tied to one specific manuscript versus using a variety or a larger source of manuscripts. So if you use the Byzantine manuscripts, there are many manuscripts dating back to around the 600s. If you go with the Alexandrian, you can get closer to the 400s, but then, uh, this is 80, then you have less. So people that are holding to just the oldest manuscript, yes, because there are less of them, there are some differences, 
Uh, some have suggested that on some of the older Alexandrian manuscripts, uh, one or two verses that have reference to the Godhead or the Trinity has been left out, and that could have been influenced by some Aryan views that we know were prevalent at the time in uh, Egypt, around Alexandria. But again, for our purposes when studying the Word of God, I think you want to compare multiple texts and find the one that is the most widely recognized. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket, as they say. So compare the manuscripts together. I think that's one of the safest ways to go. All right. Thank you very much. Pastor Doug, is keeping or not the Sabbath a salvational issue? Will one be lost if they do not accept the Sabbath? How did that come up this weekend? <laughs> but but uh, I'll answer it. Um, sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. There will be pe people in heaven that maybe didn't know about the Sabbath. They or even kept the Sabbath on the wrong day. Uh, there will be people in heaven that had too many wives because God winked at the times of ignorance. But when we know God's will and we deliberately disobey God's will, that's sin, whether it's the Sabbath or any other issue. And so hopefully that makes that clear. Could I say just a little something in uh, relation to what uh, Pastor Ross was talking about with the text? Um, you know, I'm just thinking right now as I listen. When you t think about all the different texts out there, I hope nobody's thinking, well, we don't really know what the Bible says because it depends on what text you used. And maybe what we've got is all wrong. The differences you're talking about are minuscule. So if you were to overlay all of these texts on top of each other and say, what are the differences we're talking about? They're, they're very small things around the edges. You could read a Bible from any one of these manuscripts and find Jesus and the gospel. So I don't want you to think that they had a whole different gospel. Um, so, and I know he's not saying that, but I just, I, I remember when I first heard about the differences in the Bible, boy, it just shook my foundation. I said, you mean, I don't know what I'm reading. It may not be the right Bible. When I first read the Bible up in the cave, I was reading the good news paraphrase, which is like the worst, and I found Jesus in that. So, yeah, don't, I hope that's not going to shake anyone's faith that the Bible is the inspired word of God because there was argument about the translations and the manuscripts. Yeah, maybe I just want to add one additional thought to that. Even if you are finding some things that are lacking, maybe in one manuscript, there is abundance of references within that same manuscript of that subject. Are you with me? Yeah. So even though it might leave out a verse uh, and you say, well, that's really significant. Well, there are many other verses that talk about that same subject within that same manuscript. Mm -hmm. So just because it leaves something out, it doesn't mean that the manuscript does not address that particular point or position. So bear that in mind as well. All right. Aaron, doesn't Bible translation also rely on cross-reference between books as well as between testaments? Bible translation or Bible study? What? It says Bible translation. So I'm assuming you talked about how between testaments, but they're asking, can you also do it between the books themselves to reference, cross-reference? I think instead of the word translation, study may be a little bit better. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the greatest principle to studying Scripture is to compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, you start with the immediate context. You work your way out, right? Um, to the book itself, to the author's other books, if the author wrote other books, to the testament, to similar genres, and you work your way out. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just the best way to shed light on the meaning of any particular passage. Pastor Jeff, did the earth exist when Lucifer was cast out of heaven? And if not, how was he cast down? The question is, was Lucifer cast out of heaven? Did the earth exist when Lucifer was cast out of heaven? Uh, so my understanding, the Bible does say that the earth was void. And, and, and that, did it exist? You know, that's debated. Uh, we do know that the scripture says in Genesis 1 and 2 that the earth was void and without form. And the spirit was hovering on the face of the deep. And then God spoke, let there be light. And there was light. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with the earth existing as a void planet, but um, it didn't have form and it couldn't sustain life as it was. All right. Lucas, who was the last prophet in the New Testament? 
the last prophet in in the New Testament times or the author? New Testament books, I'm assuming. Well, I'm assuming it's the Apostle John, which was the last disciple to uh, be alive. He died at the end of the first uh, century. He died of natural causes to what we know. They tried to kill him several different ways. We know that he was put into a bowl or a, how do you call it, a cauldron with boiling oil. But uh, the Apostle John uh, most yeah, certainly was the last prophet, I imagine, of the New Testament. And then the question continues is, will there be prophets? Are there prophets after? Are there prophets after? I believe, yeah, <laughs> if you're here today. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I preached a sermon here at Granite Bay maybe two years ago at this point where we talk about the, the prophetic voice to the Adventist church, but I think that this applies to all of Christianity if you read the Bible and you believe in the Bible. Um, we know that in the last days uh, there would be prophets. Right? Uh, the Bible clearly tells us in the Old Testament, was it Joel chapter 2 tells us that um, you know, your children will receive visions, your old men will see signs and wonders. And so the Bible tells us that in the end times, there would be uh, a prophetic voice or prophetic voices. So I do believe that we uh, have prophets or we will still have prophets. The Adventist church believes that there was one prophet. Additionally, before, before I pass on to Aaron, you do see a pattern in the Bible. It's a very curious, very interesting pattern. You'll see that there is a prophet to make the prophecy, and then you'll see that there is a prophet to be there for the, uh, the occurrence of the prophecy. Fulfilled. So, for example, you'll see, um, you'll see, uh, I'm, I'm blanking right now, but no, Abraham, I, I want to, Abraham no, and say, Moses. Yes, but uh, the one that I usually use is if you look at the book of the, if you look at the name of Methuselah, uh, translated, it means after this one, the water shall come. So his father, Enoch, makes that prophecy through his name, and then Noah is there for the occurrence of that prophecy. But then in Daniel, you also have a prophecy of 2,300 years. And then what happens in when 2,300 2, years go by? Who is the prophet that is there for the conclusion of that prophecy? So do you see? I believe that there are modern-day prophets, I believe, or there is a modern-day prophet, and I still believe that there will be in the future perhaps more prophets. Yeah, I think um, uh, in the New Testament we have a few lists of gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and the only gift that shows up in each one of the three lists is the gift of prophecy. And so why would there be all this, you know, talk about, hey, these spiritual gifts for the church, you know, continuing on to the church age, if the gift of prophecy would end with the close of the New Testament? All right, thank you very much. Pastor Sean, during the life of Jesus, uh, were there any other scriptures that were studied by the church that wasn't, or that aside from the Old Testament? Thank you. No. All right. Rapid fire. <laughs> Pastor John Ross, I heard the Ethiopian Bible has more than 66 books, including the Apocrypha and the books of Enoch. Why are these books missing from most Bibles? All right. Good question. You know, even today, there's some Protestant Bibles that include the Apocryphal books, as Pastor Doug mentioned. Part of the reason why the Protestant Bibles do not include the Apocryphal books is because, well, several reasons. If, if you lived back in New Testament times and you wanted to get a book in the Bible, there were certain criteria. Number one, you had to be an eyewitness of Jesus. The only exception to that is the Apostle Paul. He was an eyewitness of Jesus because Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. But other than Paul, who had a very special calling and special work, the rest of the New Testament books had some connection to Christ. They were there. They saw him. Also, if you wanted to get a book in the New Testament, you needed to have your prophetic gift recognized by the church at the time, the first century church. In other words, they needed to consider your writing as being inspired. And we have references in the New Testament of one Bible writer referring to another New Testament writer as being inspired. So there's that cross-referencing for inspiration. So if you're not an eyewitness of Jesus, or if the church did not recognize that you had the gift of prophecy and that you really were who you were, your book didn't make it in the New Testament. That's one of the criteria. So these other apocryphal books, the book of Enoch, and there's many that didn't meet that criteria, 
they were not included in the book. Of course, if the doctrine of the book conflicted with uh, earlier revelation, meaning the Old Testament, or perhaps an established letter by one of the apostles in the New Testament, and your book contradicted that, then that wouldn't be included as well. So those are some of the criteria that were looked at. And when they, when they tested the various books, they came up with the ones that we currently have in the New Testament as being validated and was recognized by the first century Christian church. And of course, uh, even amongst itself, it's recognized within those books. All right, thank you. Pastor Doug, how do I maintain a delight in reading the Bible even when it seems like it's the same old stories and when I feel like I know all the stories already? Well, I mentioned something today in, in my message that uh, something's happening to you when you read the Bible, even though you may not feel it at the time. It has a sanctifying influence. Um, and you may not understand everything you read. A baby does not understand anything its parents are saying when it's born, but it keeps listening, and eventually, somehow, along the way, they understand, though they stop admitting it when they're teenagers. <laughs> but uh, they do understand. Uh, and it's through continual listening. Um, and, you know, there's something also about reading the Bible that is a discipline. Uh, sometimes I may not feel like praying, it's usually when I need it most. Uh, sometimes I may not feel like reading the Bible. I do it anyway. Um, you've probably heard uh, Grandma say, eat. And you say, well, I don't want to eat. And they said, you need to eat. <laughs> uh, and so sometimes, you know, we, we need to eat even though we don't feel like it. Uh, a doctor will say, when you're doing a physical, how's your appetite? Because if your appetite's not good, that's not, it's usually a sign something's wrong. Uh, so we should, you know, uh, nurture an appetite for the Scripture. Amen. Pastor Aaron, how much time should we spend every day in studying the Bible? <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, the Bible itself, as was referenced by me and other uh, speakers, the Bible refers to itself as, as food, right? Thy um, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if you want to think about it in that respect, how often do you eat every day, right? At least, you know, I mean, most of us three times about, and how much time do you spend eating? Probably around a half an hour or so. So if you wanna kind of just think about the amount of time you spend eating literal food, maybe parallel that to the amount of time spend eating spiritual food, studying the word of God. There's no thus says the Lord, thou must spend you know, at least this much time, but think about it, you know, the Bible is to, it's for practical purposes for developing a relationship with Jesus. If you're going to have a relationship with someone, you need time, both quality and quantity of time. You're going to want to spend as much time, right? I, I mean, I got married six months ago, and uh, boy, I love spending time with my wife, right? And especially going up to that wedding day and just, you know, someone who you love, you want to spend time with. And I would also add, like, sure, I think it's very important to have, remember, you don't find time, you make time to study the Bible, but also, I think time during the day, if you're, you're waiting for an appointment, you're, you, know, you just have a little spare time here or there, instead of just pulling out your phone and scrolling through whatever, take that time to reflect back on what you were reading earlier that day, right? Take any moment you have to study the Word of God. Amen. Pastor Jeff, in Genesis 2, it says that the world was perfect. So why did God create the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Yeah, can I, can I piggyback on something he said earlier? Can I, I'd like to, and then I'll come to this. Um, in, in Exodus, you know, when should we study? I really like Exodus 33 and 34, where Moses has been given the assignment to bring Israel out of Egypt, and they've just, he's just encountered this golden calf you know, dance party and scantily clad, you know, mixed multitude dancing around this golden calf. And he, he's crying out to the Lord, like, you know, who's, you've told me to do this work, who's going to go with me? And, and he calls him up into the mount and he goes and he tells him, he says, be ready in the morning. Be ready in the morning and, and come up in the mount by yourself and present yourself to me there. And there's a rock right next to me. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to stand you on the rock. And I'm going to make my glory, my goodness, pass before you. And while that literally historically happened to Moses, I think there's a place right next to God on the rock for all of us. 
And I think he's calling us to be ready in the morning and to present ourselves to the Lord morning by morning and receive the revelation of his character, his glory, and that we can, we can reflect his glory throughout the day. Um, why, in Genesis 2, why did, why did, if the earth was perfect, why did he create the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? If everything was perfect, why did God place the tree of knowledge of good and evil there? Yeah, I mean, it, there was already this war in heaven, right, between Jesus Christ uh, and Lucifer. And so the claim of Lucifer was that God was not just, he was not fair. And so God makes Adam and Eve as free moral agents. And I, I love the idea, the scripture t says that he gives them every tree to eat freely of. Just one prohibition, just one law. And I think it was to... Basically, he, was, he, he didn't squash Lucifer and his angels, his rebellious angels. He said, okay, let's go ahead and make man in our own image, free moral agents, and give them the opportunity to choose who they're going to follow and let this great controversy play out as kind of a, a drama for the whole world to look on, ultimately that would vindicate the character of God, that he is fair. So, All right. All right, so one more question for each. Rapid fire. All right, and then we'll have a closer. Lucas, did the boy that found the Dead Sea Scrolls at least get a pair of shoes for what he found? Nope, walk barefoot the rest of his life. <laughs> Sean, if the Old Testament, the dra in the Old Testament, the drastic judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah is in contrast with the New Testament viewing of a loving God, how can this be the same God? Uh, common misunderstanding. There are also drastic judgments in the New Testament as well. We have uh, Ananias and Sapphira that were struck dead in, in, in moments because of the dishonesty and uh, lying to the Holy Spirit. So we find that Jesus, as he said, when you see me, you see the Father. And so the character of the Father is found in the Old Testament as the character of Jesus is found in the Old Testament as well. Okay. John Ross, how do I know which Bible translation uses the Byzantine text? Well, you want to read an English translation, but also be aware that it was originally written in Greek in the New Testament, and so use a variety of, of sources. As I mentioned to some people backstage a little earlier, I know this has got to make this quick, but don't be holden to one English translation and say this is the inspired translation, meaning the English portion of it. Recognize the Bible was not originally written in English. So don't be afraid to explore some other translations. It is a good idea to look at the source material from which it was taken. Is it Byzantine-based? Is it Alexandrian? What is the blend? And so some further study is necessary. But having said all of that, as Pastor Doug mentioned, start with the Bible that you have, all right, and start reading. And as you get into it, you can explore a little further and delve into some of the deeper aspects. But if you start reading where you are right now, it's going to be helpful. All right, Pastor Doug, where in the Bible does it first refer to God's people as Jewish or Jews? Now, normally, you want to quote Mark Twain in an answer session like this. But uh, Mark Twain said, it's not all the mysteries in the Bible that cause me sleepless nights. It's the good I know I should do. Still piggybacking on the last question. The Jew is actually, the word Jew, uh, you see, hear more about that after the Babylonian captivity because the ten tribes of Israel, uh, they were carried away by Assyria. The southern kingdom became known as Judea, and to shorten that, ended up be called, uh, they ended up being called Jews. And so from the return of the Babylonian captivity, they were often called Jews. You know, we go back to the time of Israel, and they call them Jews. They weren't really Jews back during Joseph's day. They called them Hebrews. And the word Hebrews, it comes from the word Eber, uh, one of the descendants of um, Shem, and that meant someone who crossed over. They crossed the Euphrates when Abraham crossed over. They were all called the Hebrews. But Jews are typically from the tribe of Judah, even though it might include Levi and Benjamin. All right. Pastor Aaron, what are your thoughts about the Clear Word Bible? Yeah, the Clear Word Bible uh, is a paraphrase of the Bible written by Jack Blanco, a, 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 a Bible scholar. And so it started with his devotional time. I think it's a good practice to you read Bible and paraphrase it in your own words. It's good personal devotional practice. And he just did it for the whole Bible. <laughs> and people said, hey, you should publish this thing. And so the Clear Word Bible is really a paraphrase. And so it's more of like a commentary one author's personal reflections on what, uh, on what the, the text means. It's similar to the message, 
right? The message, the clear word, and there's a couple other paraphrases out, out there. Uh, they shouldn't be used uh, very heavily for a deep study of the Word of God, but it's okay to consult them and reference them um, more so as a, uh, view it more of a commentary, a, a loose paraphrase of Scripture. All right. And Pastor Jeff, when the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth, did that include the whole universe, or was that just the earth and this immediate sky around the earth? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. But I, I think that there was definitely other galaxies already existing. Um, you know, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think that it, it, it opens up the whole question on the universe. I don't even think that we can really comprehend the whole idea of a universe because it's as eternal as God is in its existence. And, and where's the end of the universe? And if you get to the end of the, end of the universe, what's on the other side? Um, you know, so we're, we're talking about concepts that are bigger than we are and, and, and so on. So when he said that, you know, God created the stars and put the sun and the stars and the, and the moon in place, I believe that's the Milky Way. I personally accept that as the Milky Way of which we are that part of the galaxy. But, um, you know, God is a creating God. I think there's evidence in the Bible that tells us that, that God has, has been a creating God, not just on this planet. So his creative ability and exercise didn't just kind of start and end here or with the angels in heaven, but he has been creating for eternity. And uh, the last time I heard, you know, he has a lot of room to keep creating. Amen. And uh, so, yeah, I think he put the stars in place personally in our galaxy when we read the Genesis record in chapter one. Yeah, Lucas. it's... it's it's really interesting that when they took the Hubble telescope up into space and they, they could get a closer picture of um, Orion's belt, that they could see Orion's belt birthing these galaxies. And that's something through Hubble's telescope visible to man. So there's mystery, mysteries of the cosmos. Like, we don't know. Like Deuteronomy 29, 29, the... The secret things belong to the Lord, and yet those that are revealed belong to us and to our children. So, I, you know, I, I can't wait to find out a lot of things when the Lord comes and takes right. us home to heaven. Uh, All right. Lucas? Real quick, just in addition to what my colleague said, my friends here, um, when you look at the narrative of the fourth, of the fourth day here in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse, um, I had it right here, that would be like here, 14, look at what it says. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. The day from the night from where? From, the earth. from planet Earth. Yeah. The day from night from planet Earth. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years where? Earth. Planet Earth. And let them be for, uh, for lights in the firmament of where? Of the heavens. To give light where? On Earth. And it was so. Then God made two lights, the greater lights to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night where? Huh. He made of the stars also. So you see, just in addition to what Sean and, and Jeff said, I, uh, especially what Sean was saying here, I do believe that the creation of the fourth day had to do with our system of existence. I wouldn't be surprised if we get to heaven, and in heaven we see that all of this was made just for us, and God says, yeah, you know that whole big universe that you thought was so big? Yeah, it's right here. I wouldn't be surprised. But in the text here, it tells us that all of the stars, the signed seasons, it had to do with the existence of planet Earth. All right. So... Here's the last question, and I thought this was the best way to finish. And so each one of you, I'm going to give you a chance to quickly say. The person wrote, I have a friend who is struggling on how to study the Bible. What are the first steps to do so? So I thought it would be nice if each one of you gave, what is the first thing you do every day when you're going to approach the Bible? How do you study it? What is your method to start off? So Aaron, you want to go ahead and start? Go listen to my talk. No. Um, I think look, if you look at what's going on in your life and study it in a way that you say, hey, I'm, I'm dealing with depression right now, right? I'm dealing with this issue, and look for something in the Bible that can relate to the experience that you're going through right now. That can help bring the Bible alive. Okay. Pastor Lucas, how do you, your first step to study the Bible each day? I'll say it before anyone else does. Pray. Pray. You won't get anything out of the Bible if you don't have the Holy Spirit working on you. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Do that the first thing before you open it up. Pastor Sean. Yeah, that was my answer. 
Um, okay. How about after you pray? What is the next? What is the first thing you do when you? Uh, the other, the other thing I would say is that uh, you want to have a humble, teachable spirit, as we've learned through this summit as well, which is just so critical, and uh, and say, God, please tell me, teach me what you would, what you know I need the most right now in my life, and in my faith walk, and then, uh, and the other thing on a practical basis is, and I think too many of us miss out on that is is read the Bible as a whole. You know, grab the book of Genesis and say, okay, I'm not just going to kind of fly around the Bible here and there, but I'm going to read Genesis from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 50. And then I'm going to go to the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to read all the way to chapter 28. I'm going to read the entire Gospel of Matthew. And, uh, you know, that, that was my first experience with the Bible is, you know, I just picked up the Gospel, and I read through the Gospel. And I was reading it through with my wife at that time, and we were just exploring the Bible for the first time. And it was a beautiful experience. Thank you. Pastor Jeff. <clears throat> you know, um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 that, well, the Lord says in 2 Corinthians 10 that his strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, and a lot of times we have to sense our need for God before we, you know, if you don't see the problem, a lot of times you don't value the solution. And I would say see your need for God and, and just pray, Lord, give me a hunger for the Bible. Give me a hunger for Scripture. And if you're not finding joy in, the, in, in studying the Scripture, hang in there, keep studying, and ask the Lord to show you, where am I grieving the Holy Spirit? Help me to repent so I can just develop a joy in communion with you and your Word. Pastor Doug. In the 15 seconds, I would say you can enhance your Bible study a thousand percent by not eating that which is not good. You get away from the worldly media. All right. Pastor John? You know, what I found a blessing is to focus specifically on the words in red in the Bible. Spend some time just studying the words of Jesus. Just really get a feel for what Jesus is saying. That'll, that'll strengthen your devotional time. Amen. All right. Well, who wants to say thank you to our speakers for this weekend? <laughs> Amen. And we want to thank everybody that's here. Uh, for this close, thank you everybody that's watching online, different social media, Amazing Facts TV, and those that will be watching afterwards. And we want to continue to encourage you, as all the speakers have mentioned, to spend time in the Word every day. Amen? Open it and say, God, I want to see your glory. I want to see your purpose for my life. I want to see your will. Show me and guide me and reveal yourself to me, and you will be blessed with that right attitude. Amen? Amen. So let's all stand up, and let's have a word of prayer to close out this Q&A session. And I'll ask uh, Pastor Jeff, will you close us out with prayer? Sure. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you're in the midst of them. We welcome your presence. We pray that you would teach us, Lord, to love to be in your presence, to love your word. Lord, please put that enmity in us for sin. Please give us a love for righteousness, a love for communion with you. Oh, Lord, do this work in our hearts that only you can do. And we just thank you for hearing us and answering because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. You may all be seated. Amen.